Shabbat Shalom and welcome to Latin Way Ministries. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for choosing us, I should say. It would be an avenue for you to be able to learn about Father, to learn about uh, the Word. Just thank you for choosing us. And from Derek and I, and as you can see, Derek is not up here. I am here. Uh, Derek is down with his sister visiting her. Um, but as I was saying, we get we, we just thank you for being able to um, come before you and and teach the word and give you guys enlightenment as far as what scripture says. What, how it is that we are to, um, how we are called to live and just be able to be a light in, in, a, in a dark world. And that's just, I just keep reading news article after news article after news article of things that are happening in the world. And oh my goodness, labor pains are real. Hopefully he is. And it's interesting is that scripture says that he's does he's not going to prolong the last days because it says in, in Revelation that even though even if that were to happen or whatever, uh, the saints the those who are calling the chosen ones could actually even fall and um, be drawn away by the delusion and everything. Um, but let it not be. Stay strong, in Father. I mean, week after week, we stand up here, and it, to me, sometimes I feel like I repeat myself all the time, but then I look at Scripture, and just, Father repeats himself all the time. Father constantly says the same thing over and 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 over again. I remember the first time I questioned, why does he repeat himself over and over again? It's because... We are people who need to be told over and over and over and over again. One, because we forget. Two, we get drawn away by things in this world. We get drawn away by the the evil things that this world has to offer. And um, as we've been talking about the last couple weeks, um, we've been... Sorry, Derek's texting me. <laughs> we've been talking about uh, Samhain, Halloween, and we've been discussing the significance on why it is that we should not be uh, celebrating it, why we should not have any part of it and everything. And I was wondering what Father wanted me to do today, and um, part of what I wanted to do is actually... Um, I mean, I should have I should have taken more time and, and actually researched and everything. I didn't know what I was supposed to do today. I have ideas and everything, but that's my own will. And I sat here and I was trying to figure out what to do. And Father showed me what to do. So what we're going to do today, before I get into that, actually, I want to say hello to everybody out there. Hello, Pastor P. Hello, Tumar. Um... Hello, Christine and Don and everybody else who tunes in. Cindy and the baby. Um, 
I hope everybody is having a blessed Sabbath. I know Pastor Tamar and uh, Pastor P, you guys are eight, nine, ten hours ahead of us. And, uh, no, ten, twelve hours ahead of us, actually. And uh, so you're already into Sunday. So I hope you guys had a blessed Sabbath. Um, and that you guys are staying strong. So many good things are coming. So many good things. It's such an... It, such an exciting time to live like and we get worried about all the things that we we face the struggles the trials all that that just means that father has work for you and that he's using you he's making you stronger this just as the proverb says a vase i think it's a proverb um a vase breaks seven times and every time a base breaks or whatever it gets back up and it makes it stronger i butchered that i know paraphrased it um hopefully i can correct that in the end uh but all these struggles all these trials all these temptations everything that we face um it is for us to grow it is for us to uh become stronger so he can use us to a greater amount to a greater potential now if it weren't for struggles and for trials and more for all these things that we went through we would barely be able to stand we would, we would be able barely be able to be used by him tehillim psalms 92 it is good to give thanks to yahuwah and to sing praises to your name almost high to declare your loving commitment in the morning and your trustworthiness each night on the ten string and on the harp to the sounding chords of the lyre if I'm not mistaken, hmm, sorry for stopping, but if I'm not mistaken, because Psalms 92 is a psalm of Dawid, Dawud, David, and he's saying to declare your loving commitment in the morning to your trustworthiness each night. And then he goes on to say, on the ten strings and on the heart, it sounds like to me, that David, every morning and every night, the first thing he did when he woke up, the, first thing, the last thing he did before he went to bed, was to sing praises and to give thanks to Yahuwah almost high. Do we do that? That's conviction on me. I knew I saw something there the first, the first time I read that. Verse 4, just something to think about. For you have made me rejoice with your work, O Yahuwah. Shout for joy at the works of your hand. O Yahuwah, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know and the fool does not understand. When the wrongs spring up like grass and the workers of wickedness blossom, it is for them to be destroyed forever. For you, but you, Yahuwah, are on high forever. For look, your enemies, O Yahuwah, for look, your enemies do perish. All the workers of weakness are scattered. But you lift up my horn like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. And my eyes look upon my enemies. My ears hear the evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous one flourishes like a palm tree. He grows like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of Yahuwah flourish in the courts of our Elohim. They still bear fruit in old age. They are fresh and green to declare that Yahuwah is straight, my rock, and in him is no unrighteousness. So aside from what I said about the ten strings in the heart, sounds like David is telling us that the first thing in the morning we should praise him and give thanks to him that we woke up. At night, we should praise Him and give thanks to Him for all the struggles, all the trials, for all the blessings that He gave us that day. Yahushua says in, in Matthew chapter 6, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has a bunch of worries of its own. That's why we give Him praise for what happened today. We're, Derek says it all the time. We're not guaranteed 30 seconds from now, 5 seconds from now, tomorrow. We're not guaranteed anything. 
we give thanks for being able to have breath right now for being able to have a heartbeat right now but we're so worried about the new cd that's coming out or we're so worried about that concert that just got announced or we're so worried about that party that's happening tonight and that's going to allow us to dress up the way that we never would have dressed up except for that one time a year When the wrongs spring up like grass and the workers are blossom, workers are wickedness blossom, the wheat and the tares. I don't know if we've talked about this. Wheat and the tares. They all look the same until the very end when they blossom. The wheat bows down, but the tares, they stand up tall. They're strong. It is for them to be destroyed forever. And what's interesting. Now, that actually just made sense. So, you have the wheat and the tares. And when they blossom, the wheat bows down. Because it gets ends up getting top-heavy type of thing. And it just ends up bowing down. But in that... So, I'm going to give you an imagery. In Matthew, 20, in Matthew 13, you talk about the wheat and the tares. And then you have the... So, the... the the farmhand talking to the, the actual farmer saying, what should we do? Should we grab them right now? He said, no, wait until the harvest is ripe and then gather all the wheat, all the tares and bundle them up and cast them aside. So when you come up to harvest time, so you have everybody going up the right time and then harvest time happens and the wheat bows down. In order to cut down the tares, you take a sickle. If the weed's bowing down and you're going like this, you're dodging, all the weed's going to be out of the way. And you're just chopping away at the tares. The tares are making themselves known. But because we're so busy bowing down to Yahuwah and humbling ourselves, or we should be, it's going to be easy for the angels, whoever they may be, the messengers, to come and gather those who are wicked and cause them and throw them into the fire the, the, the lake of fire so there's actually some good I never saw it that way thank you father um, so what we're going to do is we are going to pray over the service we're going to pray over all those who need prayer um, I want to I want to ask if there's anybody out there watching If you guys have any prayers, you guys desire prayers, you guys want us to pray for you, have any questions. First, when it comes to questions and concerns, comments, or anything, please don't be afraid to contact us. Comment on the video when we post it up on YouTube. And comment as we say something, whatever. We want that interaction. If you have a prayer, I ask you, come to us with that prayer. Now, Father has blessed this, this ministry, this, this group of people, and it is not by my words or our words. It's by the mouth of babes, the mouth of other people, that when we pray for people, things get done. And... and the reason why I say it, and I don't want it to look boasting of self-righteousness or anything. All glory to the Father. All the glory to Yahuwah and Yahusha for allowing us to be that, that avenue, that, that ambassador and blessing to all of you out there. To be able to pray for you and to have things done. But I ask you, pray because ask us for prayer. Don't be afraid. And we want to be able to pray for you and, ha and show you the the awesomeness and the 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 majesticness and the miracles that Yahuwah has for you and who he is so if you're watching this and you have prayer please contact us comment on the video all the information is going to be at the end um, we want to interact with you 
So let's get into oh that's what we forgot. Let's get into prayer and then we will get into the service. Avina Makanu, our Father, our King. Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We praise you. We thank you so much for this Sabbath. We thank you for being able to uh, think of us and and allow us to be able to come before you in, in word, come to come before you in thanks and in praise. Father, we ask that you be glorified here today. We ask that your word be made known, that your understanding be made known to us, and that you grant us with wisdom to be able to um, spread this news to others, the good news, the, the Basora of Yahusha, and the glory and the blessings that come with obedience. Father, as we as we as we get into these teachings, may you be made known. May you be able to plant seeds deep into our heart that grow like the cedars in Lebanon and the, and the palm trees that are out there that are always flourishing. May you get rid of the doctrine and dogma that we have instilled us instilled in us and allow us to just retain the truth of your word. Father, I, I pray for all those who are asking for prayer. I pray for all those who are uh, have hurt one, have hurt loved ones, or um, have been hurt by loved ones. Uh, those who are going through uh, sickness, um, all those who are going through loss, uh, whatever it may be, that are struggling with finances. Father, may you lay your hand upon them. May you hear their cries, and may you be able to. Um, meet them where they are and show them your your goodness. Show them that you are uh, an Allahim that is there to love them, to guide them, to show them a, a greater life that is expected and a greater life that it just is abundant of truth and abundant of joy and love. No, no matter what comes to them, they will always find that satisfaction, that, that joy and that, that happiness within you. So, Father, we, we just lift up the service back up to you. We lift up this this time and learning more about you and to just gain knowledge, gain truth, and gain old, a greater understanding of who you are and just grow closer to you. So we thank you. We look forward to what you have in store. In Yahushua's name we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So without further ado, here's the teaching. All right, so today, got to start it off that way every time, right? We're going to start a new series called Are You Covenanted? Are You Covenanted? Now, the reason I wanted to get into this is because I know that as human beings, for some reason, we're, we seem to need a, a way of labeling ourselves status-wise, you know? People love to talk about being saved, and we already dealt with that, hopefully, 17 parts of Are You Saved? Or they like to be called believers, and because they like to refer to themselves and other people with these labels. Well, you know, my friend so-and-so, well, you know, she's saved, or he's saved. Well, well, what does that mean anyway? We talked about that, right? Or, well, they're a believer. Well, what do they believe? I mean, I'm sure they believe something. I mean, everybody believes something. But what does that mean when we label these things? And I, I think actually the best label we can use is covenanted. And I'm going to explore why. And what that actually means in this, in this teaching series. I don't know how many parts it's going to be because, I mean, every time I've guessed I've been wrong, so I'm not even going to try. But it's going to be more than one. How's that? <laughs> I'm pretty confident about that. I think it'll definitely be more than one. And I'm going to put this down over here so it's not in my way. So let me begin with a, a definition of covenant. A covenant is an agreement, usually formal, between two or more persons to do or not do something specified. Okay, so a covenant is a type of an agreement. Okay, and this is, a, you know, it's important that we understand that this, there's got to be agreement. See, that's when we talk about people being believers or saved or this or that. These are almost all, all the time people that you're not in agreement with or who are not necessarily in agreement with their creator. They just believe certain things that you think labels them that way. Well, they believe in the Messiah, or they believe in the Bible, they believe in something. Or they come under some sort of status because you were raised in Christianity and they use these other terms. <clears throat> so a covenant 
is an agreement, and it's usually formal, between two or more persons to do or not do something. So in a covenant, is an agreement to, of action. There's an expectation of doing or not doing. Something specified. At its most basic level, a covenant is an oath-bound relationship between two or more parties. So there's an oath that's made. And by the way, at some point, we're going to get to the chapters where we talk about making a vow. And you'll see how that relates to and why it's so serious, that whole vow and annulling vows and having a husband's or father's authority to do these things because of it being an oath-bound relationship about things and how serious that is. So it's an oath-bound relationship between two or more parties. Marriage is an example of that kind of relationship, right? Two people are making an oath to bind themselves in an agreement to do and not do certain things. Which is why when I do marriage counseling and I do the, and I'm actually the one presiding over the marriage, I in, encourage the, actually, and it's not even encouragement, I don't give them any choice. They, they have to write their own vows as to what they're agreeing to do and not do. And so, because that's essentially what they're making, a covenant. That's why it's called a marriage covenant. Isn't that ultimately what we're looking forward towards is the marriage covenant of the Lamb? Okay. So marriage is an example of this. The creator uses covenants to establish the relationship between him and his creation. Sometimes he actually makes a covenant that has to do with the whole earth. He does that. We're going to read. We get to the flood story, the account of the flood that he makes a covenant not to do that again. Okay. He says, when, so when we're looking at this, when the covenant is between Yahweh and mankind... There are conditions attached to that oath on the human side. If the human party involved in the covenant with Yahweh does not keep the covenant's conditions, there are consequences. Of course, that's one of the things that we don't like. We don't like there to be consequences. <laughs> of course, we know by the law of reaping and sowing that if there weren't consequences, this essentially mocks Yahweh. Okay, we have the verse that says, Elohim will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. And so that means that if there weren't consequences, this is actually a mockery to the creator. There has to be consequences. By the same token, that's where there's also rewards. A reward is a consequence as well. It's a result of. Okay, so we'll call consequences and rewards simply results of the behavior or the lack of behavior in accordance to a, a covenant. And so I think covenants is the core to all of this stuff. And we'll see it all the way back to the very beginning. There are some covenants that Yahweh makes to strengthen our confidence in his promises. Okay, and we're going to see that there's a difference between a covenant and a promise. Okay, we're going to find lots of promises that are not covenants, but they're promises. And then sometimes Yahweh will actually make a covenant related to promises, to strengthen our confidence in those promises. In these cases, Yahweh binds himself by his own oath to fulfill his promises that he has made. So he may make an oath that's one-sided. So it's a one-sided covenant. He's not requiring the other party to covenant anything. He's just going to make an oath and a covenant in order to make sure you believe he means what he says. Because he knows that we suffer from a disease called fear and doubt. And so that doubt is the problem. So he, may, he makes several covenants in the scriptures simply by himself with another party, simply to say, I'm covenanting, you don't have to do anything, but it's my covenant to prove that my promises, I will keep them. Not that we have really, <laughs> we should never doubt that Yahweh would keep his promises anyway. But he actually does this very formal thing called a covenant to help us to understand that he's binding himself by his own oath to keep his promises. Now, there are covenants that we also find in Scripture between people. And I'm just going to look at a couple of them quickly so you can see that a covenant is, as a, as at the basic level, is a, an oath-bound relationship between two or more parties. It can be individuals. It doesn't have to only be with Yahweh. Let's look at Genesis 14, 13 for a second. I'm just going to look at a couple of these real quickly. In Bereshit 14, 13. And we're not going to get into much detail about them. We're just going to see that there actually was a covenant thing. 
So in Genesis 14, 13, it says, And one who had escaped came and informed Avram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Anor, and they had a covenant with Abram. So there was an agreement between these parties with Abram in a relationship and how they would watch out for each other, whatever it was. They had a, a covenant. You see this in things even like in our governments today, like NATO. Right? NATO is a covenant between nations that says if somebody attacks one of us, the others will come and defend. So it's a contract or an, uh, an oath-bound relationship. So here was one with involving Abram. I'm going to read a couple of more. In Genesis 22, excuse me, 21 and verse 27. In 21, 27. So Avraham, okay, so now his name has already been changed to Avraham, took sheep and cattle and gave them to Avimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. Okay, so the two of them made a covenant. And we see in verse 32, it says, Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Av uh, Avimelech rose with uh, Pichal, the commander of the army, and they returned to the land of Philistines. So they made a covenant. Now we're not going to get into details of what it was, but they had made an agreement that bound them to each other. With, with, and and, and uh, it's not just a promise that was made. It's a higher level relationship called a covenant. We see this also in chapter 26, in verse 26. We're staying in Genesis here. We're just going to look at two more real quickly. Chapter 26 and verse 26. And Abimelech came to him from Gerer with Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Pichol, the commander of his army. And Yitzchak said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing you have hated me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We have clearly seen that Yahweh is with you. And we said, please, let there be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you do no evil to us, and we have not touched you. And as we have done only good towards you, and have sent you away in peace, you are now blessed by Yahweh. Okay, so you see, here is a covenant. And they're saying, look, we're making an oath, an agreement saying that you don't do this, and we didn't do that, and there's action involved. There was also that with Abraham and Abimelech and Abraham with uh, Mamre, Ashkel, and Anar. And the last one we'll look at is with Yaakov and Lavan in chapter 31. We'll stay there in Genesis 31. Of course, we can look at dozens and dozens of these throughout the uh, scriptures here. But I just want to show you that it's not unusual for people to make covenants. Of course, we know of marriage covenant as being one simple one. But they make covenants for various reasons. In Genesis chapter 31, and verse 43. And Levan answered and said to Yaakov, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock. And all that you see is mine. But what shall I do today to these, my daughters, or their children, whom they have borne? And now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and, I shall, and it shall be a, written, a witness between you and me. See, that's the other part of the covenant, is that covenants are witnesses. And so maybe when we see the word witness throughout Scripture, we should be thinking, I wonder what covenant it's talking about. Because a covenant is a witness between. Now, witness between what? That they've come to an agreement, and that agreement requires action on each side or things not to happen on each side. They're agreeing to do or not to do. So Yaakov took a stone and set it up as a standing column. And Yaakov said to his brothers, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap and they ate there on the heap. And Lavan called it uh, Yagar Sehodutha, but Yaakov called it Galed. And Lavan said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why its name was called Galed. Also, mitzpah, because he said, let Yahweh watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see Elohim as witness between you and me. And Lavan said to Yaakov, see this heap and see this standing column which I have placed between you and me. 
This heap is a witness, and this standing column is a witness, that I do not pass beyond this heap to you, and you do not pass beyond this heap, and this standing column to me, for evil. The Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Nahor, the Elohim of, our, of their father, rightly rule between us. And Yaakov swore by the fear of his father Yitzchak. So you see, there was in here an agreement to do and not to do. And so they covenanted, and they had something there as a witness. And in this case, they also had a physical representation. They had the pillar, they had the standing column, and the heap. And so a lot of times there is some sort of the, uh, a way to witness either a documentation. We'll see this with Israel with the tablets of stone, which the commandments are written on. We see this with a marriage with the thing called a ketubah, or the, the wedding document, as a witness, okay? And so I want to cover this real quickly just so you can see there are plenty of examples. We can go all the way through Samuel and, and, and Kings and all of those places. You can see lots of covenants being made between people. Not an unusual thing. But it's a much higher level, much more serious thing than just saying, oh, we have a little, just a handshake agreement. People took that very seriously in those areas in the world in those times. If you broke a covenant... It was a big deal. So making a covenant was a big deal. So now let's go ahead and look at covenants between Yahweh and mankind, because obviously that's what we're most concerned about, because that's us. And, you know, it's all well and good to see Abraham making covenants with different people and Yitzhak and Yaakov, etc. But what about us? Because really what we are trying to understand is when we read the scripture, how does this all impact our development, our growth, our transformation from what we are into what he is. And so we need to understand this covenant relationship because this is the status that we should be desiring. It is the status that we should hopefully be able to with confidence claim that we have is being covenanted. So we have to define that. We have to explain what that actually looks like. What does it mean? Because somebody might say, well, you know, my, my spouse is a believer. Well, but your spouse is mainstream Christian, so they're not covenanted. Oh, my, my spouse is saved, but my spouse is, uh, again, a mainstream Christian. They're not covenanted. We're going to see that covenanted has to do with when we get to Leviticus, I mean, excuse me, Exodus 19, and we see them actually make a covenant in verse 5. And so what you want to be able to talk about is covenanted people and how we treat and how we look at covenanted people may be a little different than everybody else. Not that we look down on anybody else, but there's a different expectation of those that are claiming to be covenanted. Because those who are covenanted have an expectation of doing and not doing certain specified things. Okay, so when your spouse is not under the same obligations of doing and not doing, then they're not under the same covenant you are. And so maybe they are covenanted, but not the covenant maybe that you're under. And so we have to understand this covenant. So as we go through this part, I want us to pay attention to the differences between promises and covenants, because we're going to see both as we go through this little section that we're going to go through today. Let's begin, though, first with Amos chapter 3. I want to read something important. Amos chapter 3, and then we're going to jump into Genesis and really start at the beginning. But let's begin with Amos chapter 3. Okay? Right after Joel, so I don't know if that helps you at all. <laughs> okay, before Ob 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 Obadiah. Okay, Amos chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel. Against the entire clan which I brought up from the land of Mitzrayim, saying, You alone have I known of all the clans of the earth, therefore I punish you for all your crookedness. So let's start off before we get to verse 3 and say, He's saying, You of all the clans of the earth, I have had a, a, a knowing relationship with. Remember, when we see knowing, it's relational, it's not informational. Sure, Yahweh knows all the clans of the earth as far as informationally. He says, but you of all the clans, of all the peoples of the earth, I've had a knowing relationship, an intimate relationship with. So I have this against you. 
He says, would two walk together without having agreed? In the, in the scriptures, it may say met. The Hebrew word there could easy, easily go either way. But the idea is that they're meeting in agreement. In other words, you know, we come together. It's not just that we meet like, oh, I know you and you know me. But it's saying they're, they're the idea of walking together. I'm not going to walk with you if I don't know you. And we're talking about walk, meaning like walking alongside as in terms of going in the same direction, accomplishing the same purposes, etc. Having the same vision. We're not just talking about, hey, let's just go for a walk at the park and we'll go around the path that goes, you know, a scenic path or something. Can two walk in life together, like a marriage, unless they have agreed on how that walk's going to look? Because look at the way it's, look at how it leads into this. He says, I have spoken against you because I'm the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt and you've had a relationship and I've known you and yet we're not walking together. And so how can I continue to walk with you if we're not in agreement? Is that what Yahweh's saying here? He's saying, how can you expect me to continue to walk with you when you're not walking in agreement with me? And so that's kind of the basis that I want to have us keep together is that as we're looking at covenants, covenant is a, the, the highest level, in my opinion, and, and most serious of agreements. And that is actually referring back to, I believe, Exodus 19, when he's saying, look, we have an agreement. Okay, and in that agreement, maybe we just need to read that first as the basis for all of this. Let's go to Exodus 19 just real quickly. It wasn't in my notes to do this, but I guess we should just do it just to be clear. In Exodus 19, and we're going to begin in verse 5. Let me just see what I wrote in my notes, how I wanted to do this, as I'm skipping around. Okay, let's begin in verse 3. And Moses went up to Elohim, and Yahweh called him from the mountain, saying, This is what you're going to say to the house of Yaakov, and declare to the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Mitzrites and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Isn't that the same thing we read in Amos chapter 3? He said how I brought you out of Egypt. He says, and now, verse 5, now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant. Okay, there's that word, covenant. Then you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples, for all the earth is mine. So he says, if, now remember, the covenant has in it an obligation of doing and not doing that's to be specified. Here he's being very, very specific and very general at the same time. He specifically wants us to obey his voice. In general, he's not going to tell us what specific things he's going to say that we have to agree to. It doesn't matter. Whatever he says, we're agreeing to obey his voice. He says, and if you were to do that diligently and guard this covenant, this agreement that I'm going to make with you, he says, I'm going to, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be, a, be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered, therefore, and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. Hmm. So they agreed. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moshe, see, I am coming to you in the thick cloud so that the people hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. And Moshe reported the words to the people of Yahweh. This is the covenant as it relates to us today. Oh, yes, you can go back and look at maybe a covenant that Adam made, although we don't see the word covenant in there anywhere. The first time we see it's with Noah. You can go back to the Noahic covenant. You can go back to the Davidic covenant. You can go to anywhere. You can go, you can go to any covenant you want. But really, you and I, as relates all the way through the rest of scriptures, it's about being Israel. We've talked about this many, many times in Discovering Your Identity series, that it's about being Israel and about how we could become a part of Israel and the obligations of being a citizen of Israel. The Israel of the Bible, not the Israel necessarily that was built in 1948, okay? The, the people known as Israel. And those people known as Israel eventually will have the land promised to Israel. 
And we're going to read that today as part of the promises part, like understanding that there are promises and covenants. But let's understand that in this covenant that we're talking now, here's Yahweh in, in um, Amos 3. And what is he saying? He said, I brought you out of Egypt. We had a covenant. We had an agreement, but you're not walking according to the agreement. I have this against you. See, the agreement was that you would guard the covenant, and the covenant was that you would obey my voice. That's the covenant. That's our part of it. His part, then, is to take, a, take us as his treasured people, protect us, and do all the other blessings he promises. And so he had this against them. So when you read that verse in verse 3, you should know he's referring to a covenant failure on our part. Okay? Now, what do we say about covenants? When they're not kept, there are consequences. When they are kept, there are rewards or the results. So there's a result either way. You keep the covenant, we would have been treasured people, all of the blessings that we read about in Deuteronomy, etc., Deuteronomy 28, and all those other things. Or you break it, and then you get the curses and all the other stuff. There are consequences. And that's what we see happening in Amos 3. So let's go now to Genesis chapter 6. And by the way, did you notice the people didn't hesitate? They agreed. And they agreed, and this is important for all of us, they agreed not knowing what they agreed to except that they trusted the Almighty, period. Like they trusted him without any reservation. At least that's the way they felt for that moment. <laughs> okay? But do you? Because some of you, especially if you're new, and you're learning all of this stuff now brand new, you're like, oh, I can't do that anymore? I didn't know that was involved. Or, oh, I have to now do this? Oh, I didn't realize that was part of this. That shouldn't matter if you're covenanted. See, but when you came to this, you were seeking truth. You knew you were, your peace had been disturbed. You know, he disturbed your peace and got you all questioning. But you hadn't realized that it was all going to lead back to Exodus 19 and a covenant. Where you are actually coming into a choice. Do you want to be grafted in? Well, grafting into what? A covenant. And what's the covenant? That you will do everything that comes out of his mouth. That's your covenant. You're agreeing to obey his voice and everything that he says. Diligently. <laughs> Not just in any way. You're, you're actually agreeing to diligently obey his voice and guard his commands and his instructions. Of course, we should also have full confidence and trust that the commandments do what we've always talked about. They bless us. They keep us safe. And they're the transformative vehicle that makes us change from what we are into what he is. So why wouldn't we want to do that? So that's what we're getting into. But realize that just like Israel here, all of us had that experience where we didn't really know exactly fully what we were signing in for, did we? Anybody have that feeling? That more and more comes up and you're like, I had no idea I was signing up for this. Some of you struggle mightily with this. I've gotten several phone calls and several emails a week for years. So don't, if, I'm, if, if you think I'm picking on you today, I'm not. I mean, I get them every week for years and years and years. People that are like, um, I, I'm new to this and I made some choices, but I don't know how to tell my parents or I don't know how to tell my children. Is that really the problem? No. The problem is not that you don't know how to tell them. You just say, look, I'm Torah observant. I mean, that's not the hard part. No, the hard part is you want to figure out the magic words that when you tell them, they don't go nuts and ballistic and disown you. Yeah. See, that's what you're trying to say, but that's not the words you're using. You're saying, well, I, I don't really know how to tell my parents, you know, and I don't really know how to tell my children. Well, that's not really the problem. It's not like there's really a challenge in using the word saying, hey, I've been going on this journey and I found this to be true and I'm walking this. No, but you want the words that are going to keep them from reacting the way you know they will. Well, why are you afraid of that? He says, if you diligently obey my voice, period. You also know that in the New Testament... In the Birch Kaddashah, Yeshua tells us that when you make these decisions and choices, your family members may not be thrilled. 
So why are we afraid of that? Well, because it's going to be awful. Yeah, it is. But why are you afraid of that? He says, Father, I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but just to keep them from the world. So we have to live in this place. This is not a fun place to live, unless it's under his authority. And it's not at the moment. So that's why it's not a fun place to live. But see, that goes back to, if you're covenanted, you simply explain, when you, how do I explain this to my children? Explain to them that you, just, you came to realize you need to be covenanted. And in that covenant, it requires you to diligently obey his voice, which means that you're not eating pork anymore, shellfish and catfish, and you're going to go start keeping Saturday, not Sunday. You're not doing Christmas. And, you know, in other words, you're going to diligently obey his voice. And I'm just letting you know, family, so that you know. Especially as we start coming around, you know, we're circling into the fall now, which means all of that Christmas stuff is going to come up for all the first timers. And then how do I tell my family I'm not doing this? Um, you tell them. But, but, what do you mean, but, but? Yeah, they're going to react whatever way they do. Some of you may be surprised that they don't react as bad as you think. Some of you may be surprised they act worse than you thought. But they're going to do whatever they're going to do. Why does it make any difference as to what you do? You need to do what you need to do. Now, you don't need to go tell everybody you've made this choice unless they need to know. So obviously, if there's things that happen like Christmas, which the family usually does certain things together, and certain things happen with presents and parties or dinners or whatever, well, yeah, you're going to have to tell them you're not doing it. That part you're going to have to communicate. Some of you who are watching a live stream need to stop going to your Sunday churches. I mean, when are you going to get your foot out of the other camp and be of two minds? But, but, <laughs> what's the but, but? Do you think that you're the only one that's ever had to deal with this? Or you're the first person that, but you don't understand. My family's, all, all everybody in my family's a, a pastor. Don't laugh. I've had like 80 million conversations with people that have told me that. If you live in the South, everybody's relative's a pastor. I'm telling you, you don't understand. My sister's a pastor. My brother's a pastor. I'm 17 generations of pastors. Okay, fine. So what? What's your point? So you're not going to covenant? Well, good. Then don't covenant. Nobody's forcing you. When are you going to stand up and, 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 and make, a, make a choice, make a decision and a commitment? That's what the people had to do here. And of course, you see them failing at it a lot of times. And oh, we can look at them going, what's wrong with these people? What's wrong with you? You've got your own moments like they did. Oh, it's so easy to judge them. How could they see those signs and wonders and miracles and then do what they did, not going in the land when they saw the giants and stuff? I don't know. Giants? We're talking about real 13, 14, 15 foot people. And you're afraid of your five foot mother. <laughs> If she's that tall. <laughs> and you judge these guys who are afraid of legitimate giants in big walled cities. And you're afraid of your sister or your brother. Why? Because they're, yeah, they are. Whatever it is, the because they're, yes, they're going to do that. Rabbi, please pray. No, I'm not praying against it. You actually, because you're so upset about it, you need to go through it. I'm not praying against it. That sounds mean. It's not mean. This is a hard world we live in. And you're making a hard choice to stand up against the, you're going swimming against the stream here. Okay, you're going against the grain. You need that experience because you need to have that growth that fire to go through to strengthen you. Because I promise you, if you live long enough, it's only going to get a lot worse. Isn't that great to know you signed up for that? This is nothing. Oh, I know it's going to feel miserable, but it's nothing compared to what's coming. At least that's according to Scripture. You've all read it. 
And you all want it to happen in your lifetime. We're all talking about, oh, these are the last days. Well, do you really understand what the de- that fearsome and awesome day of Yahweh really is going to look like? Do you really w- want to be excited about that? I'm excited about what happens after that. Okay? I am not excited about that. Nobody should want to go through all that. It's going to be, as described, the worst thing ever to happen on this planet that human beings can go and experience. And so, no, you don't want to be looking forward to that, but you know what? You're going to need to toughen up to be ready for it. And so Abba's going to put you through some things that are pretty tough because it'll strengthen you, it'll grow you. And if you can't even tell your friends and coworkers and bosses and whatever and family members, (laughs) what what happens when it really gets tough? Oh, but you don't know my mother. (laughs) Come on. Everybody has somebody like that in their life. So maybe it's not your mom. Maybe it's your brother. Maybe it's your coworker. Maybe it's somebody, your best friend. We all have somebody that, you know, we're afraid is going to give us grief. Worse than that, we're afraid they'll cut us off and we'll lose the relationship. Well, which relationship are you more worried about losing? The one with him, the creator, or the one with some human being? When you read scripture, do you see a lot of relationships lost? Absolutely, all the time. But you know what? What does it say? You know, it says in the New Testament, what is it for a man to, right? To save his life, but to lose everything. Or to lose his life and to gain everything. Right? What do you really want? Why are you even here? Why are you going through all this? You know, we did that whole series, Endure and Receive the Crown of Life. Go back and listen to that three or four times. It'll help you understand why we're doing all this and how hard it's going to be. And the stuff that some of you call me up about, and I'm not saying like last week, I'm talking about just over the years, it's, it's really unbelievable to me. Because, I, and, I, and I'll call you on it when you call me. I said, well, I don't know what to say to this. Or, as, look, is it that you don't know what to say, you're just afraid of what the response is going to be, and you're looking for the magic words. That's really what's going on, isn't it? You're trying to figure out a way to avoid what you know is going to happen. Sometimes you can't avoid what you know is going to happen. But you've got to do it anyway. Yeshua, can we agree, knew exactly what was going to happen to him? And he did it anyway, didn't he? He could have avoided going to Jerusalem. He didn't have to go to Jerusalem. He could have avoided that. He certainly didn't have to go there right before Passover. Because he certainly knew what was going to happen. He said, he told them over and over again, they're going to arrest me. They're going to kill me. He told them. He knew. But he also knew what? That he counted it nothing compared to the glory, compared to the reward, compared to what was waiting for him. Okay? Can you do the same thing? That's what we're covenanting. That's the whole point of the covenant. I'm going to tie this right back to the covenant. You know, when we do our, I don't know about everybody out there, but when you through MTY do the mikvah, you get baptized, you get immersed, we have you make eight declarations. Those are covenantal declarations. In front of witnesses, like a marriage. And I say that to all of you before we do it. I said, this is like a marriage. It's a private covenant between you and your creator, just like a marriage is between you and your spouse, in front of witnesses where you make declarations. And those declarations, if you remember the eight declarations, were things that you were covenanting to do and not do. The last one being to walk out your life in such a way as to bring the names of Yahweh and Yeshua glory and honor and not shame. That's an oath that includes action, doing and not doing. That's a covenant. And so you covenanted. But you know what? Then you got wet and you came out of the water and you were all excited and you were all great for about five minutes and then the life started again. Maybe you need to take the eight declarations and put them up real big on your wall somewhere. And so you can see, you made those covenants, those promises. But they're not just promises, they're commitments. And that's why it says specifically in each one, of my own free will, I have chosen to do this, this, and this, or to stop doing this, this, and this. 
And that's a big, that's a big thing. And that's why we have those eight declarations. Now, there's nowhere in Scripture that says we need to do it that way. I just felt that that's what the Scripture, not the Scripture, the Spirit gave me. You know, when I prayed, Abba, how? You know, if you ever get into ministry, the first thing you're going to realize is you're going to need to know how to do certain things because people are going to expect you to do a wedding or a funeral or a baptism. And guess what? There's no such scripture on how to do any of that. You can't show me the wedding verses. You can't show me the, the, the funeral verses. You can, now, you can show me the ones that people typically use at a wedding or funeral, but there's no verses say, and this is how you do a funeral. Or this is how you do a wedding. Or this is what you do at a baptism or a mikvah, immersion, tevila. There are no verses for that. So we have to hope that Abba will inspire leadership to know what to do. And so this is what he's inspired me to do anyway. But I, I want you to understand that it's covenantal. It's, a, it's your making commitments and promises to being a part of a covenant relationship called Israel. That covenant relationship is established right here in Exodus 19, verse 5. The, the agreement to diligently obey his voice. A lot of us are somewhat reluctantly obeying his voice. <laughs> Casually obeying. Diligent. Diligence is the key. And that's really important. Okay? I think we have a teaching with that word in it. All right? And so we want to make sure that you're diligently obeying. Now we go to Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to see the first reference to the word covenant. In the Hebrew, this is brit. Okay? A brit. As a matter of fact, they, they will call when, a, when a, a, a boy is circumcised on the eighth day, in the Hebrew, they call that a Brit. A Brit Milah. Okay? Or if you're Ashkenazi, it's a Bris. Okay? It's a covenant. Because we're going to read not only about covenants, but we're going to read about things that are signs of covenant. Signs that you are covenanted. That you are a part of a covenant. The Brit Milah, circumcision, is a sign of covenant. It's not a covenant in itself. It's a part of the covenant in that they expect you to do these things to show and demonstrate that you are committed and in that covenant. We're going to see this in many places. Genesis chapter 6 and in verse 3. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. He is flesh and his days shall be 120. Now in that verse... I believe it's hints that there's already a covenant in place. It doesn't say it. But he's saying, I'm not going to strive with man. And I don't think he'd be striving unless there was an expectation. Hey, we've agreed and you're not keeping the agreement and I'm tired of fighting with you about this or striving with you and having you go astray. Doesn't it sound like that? Like a husband and a wife saying, you know what? This is just... I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of just battling with you all the time. We just don't agree. We're, we're not on the same page. So it doesn't say there was a covenant in place here. And the word covenant doesn't appear until a few verses later for the first time in Scripture. But yet, I believe that verse hints that there was one in place. And he said, I'm not. And he says, my spirit shall not strive. But by spirit, what do we understand the word spirit to mean? His intrinsic nature. He says, my nature is not going to strive against man's nature. Because your nature was supposed to be transformed into mine, and you are not allowing it to happen. You are striving against it. You're stubborn. You're stiff-necked. All these other things. Self-sovereign. You're not allowing the process. And so I'm not going to strive with you anymore. Now we drop down to verse 5. Yahweh saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Of course, the whole heart of the matter teaching really deals with that, okay? And the what are you thinking teaching, the thoughts of his heart. Interesting that we're talking about thoughts and heart as opposed to thoughts we think of usually as the mind or the brain. See, when the thoughts are coming out of the heart, that means we're emotion driven, we're desire driven. We're, we're, um, 
lust driven lust I always like to make sure to remind everyone lust doesn't just mean sexual I mean that word seems to always be connected mostly to sexual it means that strong overriding craving desire for something it could be anything okay and he says look I saw that every inclination of the thoughts of their heart was on, on evil. So what's evil scripturally defined as? Anything that goes against Yahweh's way. Okay? That's evil. Anything that goes against the design of the creator. So Torah teaches us what is right and what is wrong. So what's, what's good and what is evil. If we do things according to Torah, the way things are designed, you were designed to live by Torah. I know you were told that the Torah is done away with. Well, that's really funny considering that's the one thing you need to know how to do everything because you were designed to live by it. And so when you try to live not by it, it doesn't work very well. And people are frustrated, depressed, and the suicide rate is going out off the charts and the depression rate is off the charts and people who are just lost is off the charts. And lost, I don't mean like the way Christians do. I mean like they're just, have no idea where they are, what they're doing, where they're going. They're just, they're massive confusion, we'll call it. Okay, they literally look like they're lost. Okay, I don't mean that in the Christianese, oh, we have to save the lost, you know. I'm talking about they like literally, they just are clueless. They have no idea what's going on. They've lost their way. Why? Because you can't have any of that without Torah. Because you were designed to live according to it. Because that's why when you, he says, great peace shall you have when you walk in his commands. Why would you have peace? Because it's the stabilizer. It's the grounding. It's the centering of your life. Oh, but we want to say, as a Christian, you say, oh no, Messiah is all that stuff. Well, if you understand that he's the walking, talking, living Torah, Yes. Of course he is, all that stuff. But if you're going to say he is, but he somehow is separate from Torah, you've missed the whole point. You know? I mean, there are songs out there and other things out there, like the center of the mark and other things that have to do with hitting that mark. But you're not going to hit it if you don't understand that Yeshua is the center, but that's because he is the fullness of the embodiment of what it looks like when life is lived fully Torah observant. That's the center. And so we can see here that mankind somehow is off that mark. And they're just not listening at all. So I believe that it's hinted here that there was a covenant being broken. And so now what we're going to see is that there's consequences, which also makes me feel like there was a covenant because of the consequences. Okay? He says here, in verse, uh, we, we just read verse 5, verse 6, Yahweh was sorry they had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And Yahweh said, I am going to wipe off man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping creature, and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Wow. I mean, think about how bad that had gotten for Yahweh to be like, you know what? I'm sorry I made these guys. All they're doing is breaking my heart and giving each other grief all the time. You know, some of you have had the very sad experience of looking at your children, especially if you're older, and have adult children that have just gone the wrong way, saying, my children are, have given me nothing but heartache. They're, they're, they've caused nothing but sadness. Or so maybe a parent has told you that <laughs> when you were not Torah observant yet and just a wild, whatever crazy person that you might have been. But this is a parent looking down at his children saying, you're just, all you're doing is, is causing grief for each other, for me, for everybody. Because of what? The thoughts of their hearts, which means that they were craving, desiring. This goes back to the whole idea of coveting. Okay, we talked about this, I think, earlier during the prayer time. But just to understand that we're being run by this idea of desire, of covenant. I mean, of coveting. I want, I need, I... Instead of saying, I appreciate what I have. And so, that's the root of all evils, is not money. It says the desire, the love of money can be at the root of all kinds of evils. But, why, but what is the desire? It's the coveting. 
Okay, it's the coveting of something causes all kinds of evil. We don't commit adultery unless we covet. We don't steal unless we covet. We don't murder unless there's some sort of coveting. We don't keep all the commandments, right? These are all because we covet. And so that was going on all throughout the earth. So Yahweh says, I'm going to wipe everybody out. I'm going to wipe everything out. But Noah, Noah found merited favor in the eyes of Yahweh. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. Noah, listen, back to Amos chapter 3, Noah walked with Yahweh. Hmm. So Noah walked in agreement, in covenant, like we talked about in Amos 3. Two can't walk together unless they have agreed. And so here, it says that Noah was different than the rest of the world. Noah walked with Elohim, not against, not striving against. You know, picture when you're walking with your two-year-old, and your two-year-old is grabbing you and pulling you, wanting to go one way, and you're like, no, we're going this way, and you're getting a little tired of them yanking you the other way. How are you walking together? But that's kind of what mankind had become. They had become this, but I want to go this way. And now he's like, no, 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 come this way. This is the right way. This way leads to joy, peace, abundance, everything. No, no, but that looks better over there. I want to go over there. Because you see, Yahweh's path means you might have to wait 10 years for whatever. Your path looks like you can have it now. Does that make sense? You know, I, I remember being at a seminar. It was for, uh, I don't know what it was. It was a multi-level marketing thing many, many, many years ago or something. And the guest speaker came in and said, the reason most people don't have what they want in life, what they really want in life, is because they're too busy trying to get what they want right now. And getting what you want right now will often prevent you from getting what you really want because you're short-circuiting all of the funds in the, or the whatever it is that you need, the means to get to where you really want to go because you're busy getting what you want right this second. And if you'd only give up what you want right this second, eventually you can get what you really want. It's called delayed gratification. <clears throat> oh, we're terrible at that. See, it, it, only a human being with its lusts and cravings could invent a credit card. <laughs> Think about it. It's the cure for delayed gratification. You don't have to go to the bank and go through the arduous and embarrassing process of filling out five million forms and trying to prove creditworthiness so that you could take out a loan so you could buy that car. Well, I guess a car, you might have to do the loan thing. But I mean, let's say something like uh, that's not quite as expensive. But you just put it on the credit card. As a matter of fact, today you probably could put a car on the credit card. Okay, this ministry has spent more on American Express in a month than a car costs. So I'm sure I could put a car on a credit card. But people don't understand, a credit card is not money. It's instant loans. You're borrowing every time you use it. That's why, they, that's why they, they've taken away the process in your mind. People tell you, oh, you can spend that, you can spend money with a credit card. No, you can't. You're borrowing. But it's instant gratification. You don't have to wait. You know, there's a guy out there, Dave Ramsey, who does a very good uh, financial, you know, uh, teachings that he does, you know, about how to get out of debt and everything. One of the things he always said is, he says, if you are willing to live like nobody else, meaning like suffer, put away, put off, delay your gratification, then one day you'll live like nobody else. If you're willing to pay for your car cash, pay for your house cash, pay for things cash. Not get yourself all swamped and dead and all chained and, and, you know, down to the burdens. But are you willing to delay? See, what does Yeshua say? He says, don't worry about treasuring up your treasures here, right? But you want to treasure up your treasures in heaven. In other words, stuff that you don't get to have now, you don't get to enjoy now, you don't get to benefit from now, but are you willing to wait? Oh, but I want it now. You know, what's that song by Queen? I want it all and I want it now. <laughs> that sounds like human beings, right? I want it all and I want it now. <laughs> I 
And that's where we run into all this trouble, right? He says, but Noah, Noah walked with Elohim. He trusted Elohim. He was righteous. What does the word righteous mean? He was doing what is right. Well, what's right? Only that which comes from Yahweh. Yahweh decides and determines what's right and what's wrong. So for him to be righteous, it means he was doing things according to Yahweh's will and instruction. So there must have been some information here that we don't read about that Noah had. Noah had access to and was part of a covenant because they were in agreement and they were walking together. So that's why Noah gets selected here. Not because he was just a nice guy, a good-looking guy, a sweetheart of a guy, you know, just a fun-loving guy. No, he was a righteous man, perfect in his generations, who walked with Elohim. He wasn't striving like the others were in verse 3. Verse 10, so Noah brought forth three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yepheth, and the earth was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth and saw that it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Now, by the way, when it said it was full of violence, don't all only link that idea of violence to physical violence. It is violence. Think about, well, I guess I should read it to you real quickly. Ezekiel 22. Okay? Let's go there. That's not even in my notes, but that's okay. Ezekiel 22. All right? What kind of violence is he talking about? See, this is why, see, if you were to study your word and study your scripture and open yourself up, this is what the spirit does. You want to know what, because people say, well, I want to see the spirit moving. You just saw it. I was reading something in Genesis and the spirit moved to remind me of a verse. See, it doesn't have to be something like gold dust flying out of the ceiling and landing on people. It can be something as simple as that's what the Spirit does. It will bring and stir to remembrance. I do not have anywhere in my notes that I was going to go to Ezekiel 22, but in reading the verse, that's what the Spirit does. Because look at what we just read. It said, it says, Elohim looked, this is back in that verse, he said, for all the, uh, it was corrupt. Uh, no, verse 11, it said, the earth was corrupt before Elohim and the earth was filled with violence. And so we don't know what that looks like, except no, what are we thinking? They were all running around with swords and things killing each other. Isn't that what you're thinking? Everybody fighting all over the place, beating each other up and killing each other. But look what it says in Ezekiel 22, verse 26. Her priests have done violence to my teaching. And they profane my set-apart matters. They have not distinguished between the set-apart and profane, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I profaned in their midst. Do you think maybe that was going on in Genesis chapter 6? Could that be the violence that we're talking about? Sure, there was killing going on also. Because one of the things he tells us is not to murder. So I'm sure that was happening. I'm sure there was raping and pillaging and stealing and all the other stuff that's violent. But really, it's all things, not just that kind of violence, but included with that is the violence to his teachings. So, because I think we can assume, because of Noah walking with him, that there had already been instruction. There had already, we, we, see, that, we see that with Adam and, and Chava when they have their children, all right, and, and, and Cain and Havel, what do we see? What did Yahweh say? He says, well, you should know how to do this. And if you do it the right way, what do you mean the right way? You mean there's a right way? Of course they knew there was a right way. He had taught them. Just because we don't read about it doesn't mean it's not there. We have to look at what's implied. Like when we read in verse 3 of chapter 6, when it said, my spirit shall not strive forever with man, we can see that this implies that there was a, an agreement that was being broken even though we don't read anywhere where that agreement was made. And so here he says that there was violence and was filled the earth. Let's go back to Genesis. In verse 12 it says, And Elohim looked upon earth and saw that it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And see, I am going to destroy them from the earth. Also, this connects back to verse 3 where he says, I'm tired of striving with them. They want to do things violently to my teachings, and I want them to obey my teachings. So he says to him in verse uh, 14, he says, 
Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with tar. And this is how you are to make it. And he gives the dimensions of it. And then he goes to verse 17. And see, I am myself. I am bringing a floodwaters on the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is breath of life. And under the heavens, all that is on the earth is to die. Now look at verse 18. This is the first place we see the word covenant. He says, and I shall establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. I think even in the way he says it in verse 18, I almost feel there's a hint saying, the covenant that I already had with others, which they broke, I'm now going to covenant with you. I think there was always one. I think it started with Adam and that it was intended to go all the way through to the end. He says, but I'm now going to covenant with you. I don't think Yahweh's covenants are ever different. It's the same covenant all the way through. He says, but they blew it. I'm tired of striving with them. You're walking with me. I'm now going to covenant with you. He says, I'm going to covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. Okay, so this is, this is it. Now, my, I wrote in my notes here, this, this is the first reference to the covenant, but is it actually the first covenant. So my point is, I don't think this is actually the first covenant. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. So what we're looking for is hints of a covenant. Okay, I think we're barely just going to get this done here for today. So what did we say that a covenant is? It's an agreement between individuals, two or more, with expectations and consequences. So just because the word covenant isn't used doesn't mean that there wasn't a covenant. Look what happens here in Genesis 2. And we're going to go to verse 15. And Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. Notice what he says here. Yahweh took man, put him in the garden to do something. So there's a relationship and an expectation, right? To guard it and to work it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. That sounds like a covenant. He said, I put you here to do something, and here's the relationship. I put you in the garden, I gave you the garden, I gave you everything you need, I expect you to work that garden, I allow you to eat anything you want, you just can't eat this, if you eat this, you're going to die. See, that's covenant language. Remember we've done a lot of teachings where we talk about seeing discipleship language? Now we're going to be looking for covenant language. So here you are in the very beginning with the very first created beings and you see covenant language. Okay, he says, I'm going to put you here in this garden. You didn't have anything. You have a garden now. It's yours. And you can eat everything except from this one tree and I expect you to work this garden and guard after it. That's, that's, our, new, that's our relationship. It's a covenant. Like a marriage. Okay, so here's, here's the thing. I've, I've taken you, I've placed you here. This is what I provided you. This is what I expect. And that's a covenant. And it had consequences. He said, but if you eat of this tree, you shall certainly die. So now we go to chapter 3. And we get in verse 1. And the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, is it true that Elohim has said, do not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we are to eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, do not eat of it, nor touch it, lest you die. Now, of course, he didn't say don't touch it in the verse we read in chapter 2. He may or may not have said that, but that's okay. But she said, don't eat or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall certainly not die. For Elohim knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they saw, excuse me, and they knew that they were naked, and they saw, uh, sewed fig leaves together and made loin coverings for themselves. And they heard the sound of Yahweh Elohim walking about in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim among the trees of the garden." And Yahweh said, uh, called to Adam, said, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who made you know that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? 
And the man said, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the tree and I ate. And Yahweh Elohim said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Everybody's passing the buck. You notice that? And see, this is the problem we started off with, right? I said, nobody wants to take responsibility for themselves. This is the big problem. Okay? People don't want to take responsibility for themselves. Okay. Actually, I don't think I said it during the teaching. I probably said it during prayer time. But anyway, just so you guys know, I said earlier, the whole world is suffering from this one main problem. It's the underlying problem of everything. People not being willing to take responsibility for their own actions and their own circumstances. Yes, other people may have caused you to be in circumstances. You can choose to stay in them or not. How you react to things is always your free choice. Okay. So here they are pointing the finger everywhere. Yahweh, verse 14, says to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you are to go, and he's dust all the days of your life. And I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, and you shall crush his heel. To the woman, he said, I greatly increase your sorrow and your conception. Bring forth children in pain and your desires for your husband, and he does rule over you. And to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, do not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you are to eat of it all the days of your life. And the ground shall bring forth thorns and thistles for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you are to eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you return. And the man called his wife's name Chava, because she became the mother of all living. And Yahweh made uh, coats of skin for the man and his wife, and dressed them. And Yahweh Elohim said, See, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now let us put out his hand, uh, lest he put out his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. So Yahweh Elohim sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out, and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden. Uh, at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Okay, so I read all that real quickly because it's almost uh, 70 minutes into this thing, but also because it's not about every detail here. Oh boy, we could break this all down. Maybe we'll do that a little bit next week. But the point is, you see there was a covenant, there was an agreement. I told you to till the earth, ground, work this place, take care of the garden, guard it, and I told you you can eat everything except from this one tree. And did you listen? No, there was consequences. And so what were the consequences? Well, they got thrown out. And there, was, there were other sufferings that were going to come of it. It wasn't going to be, you know, according to what we're seeing here, apparently the ground was really easy to till and all this other stuff was really easy to do. Until this moment. And childbirth might not have been a big deal until this moment. Okay? So there are consequences which lead us to believe this was a covenant, the first covenant being made that the two would walk together and have a relationship that was covenanted. So hopefully that we can see this, that Yahweh establishes this covenant and that they then get thrown out of the garden for this. And we can see that these are the consequences. Now we could break down other things in here and explain these consequences and maybe we'll do that next week and maybe we'll do it another time. It really is not relevant to the point we're trying to make about covenant. Because I know lots of people want to go to, well, the prophecy about the enmity between you and the woman and this. Well, that has nothing to do with today's teaching. Or we could talk about whose fault was it really. Well, that has nothing to do with today's teaching. The point is that because of a desire, what did you see her do? The lust of the eyes. Right? She said, oh, I see it looks good. Okay, lust of the flesh, it's good for me. She, so she's basically rational lied to herself. By listening to what the devil does. Did the devil really put the idea in her head? No. He encouraged her in a place she was already, she already noticed the fruit. She had her eye on it probably for a while. She's like, oh yeah, you know. And he's saying, well, come on, you know you're not going to die. Go ahead, you want to do it? And that's really what the devil ends up doing with us all the time. And just a quick note, notice that he's not crawling on the ground on his belly till after the event. Okay, so my, my friend the atheist used to joke with me and say, hey, you believe in a talking snake? I said, well, he wasn't a snake when he was talking. Okay, 
He got punished to start crawling on the ground. Go back and read the book. Okay, but telling the atheist to read the book is not always going to work very well. Okay? I said, well, if you're going to pick on the book, at least know what it says. Okay? He got cursed to crawl on the ground on his belly after the event as part of his punishment. Okay, so let's understand how that worked. So this is the beginnings of understanding covenant. So I want us to see, yes, the first place we see covenants with Noah. We can see the consequences there where there were a flood. Okay, and then the new covenant is now being made with Noah. But we're also going to see, though, is that the idea of there being a new covenant is not a new covenant. In other words, it's not completely different everything. He's saying, I'm going to make my covenant, which I make. And by the way, I'm going to put this little hypothesis out there. Every covenant Yahweh makes with his people is the same covenant. He just makes it at different times to different people. Now, he does make covenants that have to do with himself fulfilling promises. We haven't shown that yet. But the covenant, when he says, I'm going to make my covenant with you, Noah, that's the same covenant that was with Adam. It's the same covenant we're going to see eventually with Israel. The same covenant that we see in Jeremiah 31 when he said, I'm going to make a renewed covenant. And the covenant is always about, I will tell you what needs to be done and how it gets done, and you agree and do what I say. Isn't that exactly what happened with Adam? I'm going to give you everything with only certain restrictions. And that's still what he did with Moses, right? I'm going to give you guys everything. You're going to have land that produces. You're going to have rain in due season. Nobody's going to be infertile, not you, your animals, or anybody. You're going to have all this. Nobody's going to give you any grief. Nobody's going to come and fight you and hurt you. All you got to do is do certain things and not do certain things. Obey my voice. And so the question that I'll leave you with is, are you covenanted? I'm going to go into it over and over again for the next couple of parts until we get to the final conclusion of this where we're going to see that it's about being covenanted. That's the one status. If you want to use that status in my presence, it's about being co someone's covenanted or not covenanted. If you're using it correctly, I would be okay with that. I'm a little worn out with the so-and-so, you know, they're saved or so-and-so, they're a believer. What I want to know is if they're covenanted. And by the way, don't tell me somebody's covenanted if you don't know because you don't know what people are really doing. The wheat and the tares together. They both look like they're covenanted, don't they? So you really don't know. So I'd be really mostly concerned with you. <laughs> Figure out whether or not you're covenanted. All, All right, so today we're continuing in Are You Covenanted? This is part two. Okay, this is part two. I didn't even have to write that on here. This is part two. All right, Are You Covenanted? Now let's just remind ourselves what we're talking about here. A covenant is an agreement, usually formal, between two or more persons to do or not do something specified. Okay, that's what a covenant is. At its most basic level, a covenant is an oath-bound relationship between two or more parties. Marriage is an example of this relationship. The creator uses covenants to establish the relationship between him and his creation. When the covenant is between Yahweh and mankind, there are conditions attached. Okay, we need to pay attention now because this is us, right? Between him and us, mankind, there are conditions attached to that oath on the human side. Okay? So when he's going to covenant with us, there's an expectation. There are conditions he's expecting us to meet. If the human party involved in the covenant with Yahweh does not keep the covenant's conditions, there are conditions absolutely going to be consequences. All right? There are consequences. We just covered that in this week's Torah portion, reading Deuteronomy 28. Talks about consequences to the covenant. All right? There are some covenants that Yahweh makes to strengthen our confidence in his promises. Okay? And that's one of the things we have to remember. There are some of the covenants that he does to make us more confident in promises. Promises and covenants are not the same thing. Okay, so let's be careful that we don't confuse them as being the same thing. So we're going to look at, through Genesis here, we're going to continue in Bereshit in Genesis, and we're going to see covenants and how they work and interact with the idea of promises that are being made. Because, see, we have a lot of people out there, and we started with this from the, well, people refer to themselves as saved or believers or whatever. They affect these statuses, these titles they want to put on themselves. Well, I think the only title we need to really worry about is are you covenanted? All right? Because a lot of people say they're believers, but they're not covenanted. 
Because the covenant has conditions and a specified expectation of doing or not doing. And so a person who says that they're a believer, but they're in mainstream Christianity, guess what they're not doing? They're not doing the doing. Okay? Because that's been obviously, according to them, done away with, nailed to the cross, blah, blah, blah. Well, the covenant specifies that doing. There is no place anywhere in Scripture that does away with what that covenant says. Okay? You can break a covenant. You don't get to change the covenant. The covenant is what it is. Once it's in place, that's it. Now, we're going to see several different places where covenants are made. They're made between specific members. A covenant is between two or more parties. When we're looking at is what covenant are we a part of? What covenant is it talking about us being grafted into? Where there's an expectation of doing and not doing specified things. So now we, we looked at the beginning through Genesis and the, you know, the very beginning with, with Adam. Now we're going to go to Noah. We're going to go to chapter 9. Okay, Genesis chapter 9. And we're going to look at things going on with Noah. With Noah. And we'll begin in verse 1. And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Bear fruit and increase and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you is on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the heavens, and all that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they have been given. Every moving creature that lives is food for you, and I have given you all as I gave the green plants. Do not eat the flesh of its life, its blood, but only your blood for your lives I require. From the hand of every beast I require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother I require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood is shed. For in the image of Elohim he, uh, has he made man. As for you, bear fruit and increase. Bring forth teemingly in the earth and increase in it. And Elohim spoke to Noah and to his sons with him saying, And see... Excuse me, and I, see, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So now we're hearing that these things that he's talking about are connected to a covenant. He says, I'm going to make my covenant with you and, my, and your seed after you. Now, he's not saying that these are the things limited to the covenant. Now, we have people that will talk about the Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, like there are different covenants. Well, often what we see is he's saying, I'm going to make a covenant you or I'm going to make my covenant. My covenant means this is the thing that's supposed to go forward to the peoples. This is not just a private covenant like you'll see him make with Abraham. It's promising him certain things. But this is a covenant where he's saying, this is going to be my covenant going forward. That's what he says. I establish my covenant with you and your seed after you. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's limited to these few things he says beforehand about the beasts of the earth, etc., and the creatures. But listen to what he goes forward to say. I'm going to make my covenant with you, and verse 11, right? Um, no, sorry, verse 10. With you and every living creature that is with you, of the birds, of the cattle, and of the, every beast of the earth with you, and all that go into the ark, every beast of the earth. And I shall establish my covenant with you, and never again is all flesh cut off by waters of the flood, and never again is there a flood to destroy the earth. So he's covenanting really not to do a flood. This wasn't a relationship covenant that says, well, if you do this or don't do that, then I will do this or that. He's simply saying, I am promising you, and I'm doing it as a covenant, that I will never again flood the earth to destroy all men and all creatures. To destroy the earth. And Elohim said, This is the sign of the covenant which I have made between you and me and every living creature that is with you for all generations to come. I shall set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So now, when we get to verse, remember we got to verse 9, it says, See, I established my covenant. It'd be easy for us, and I already did that for you just because I played into what you would normally think, that the stuff beforehand was the covenant. That Noahic covenant talking about the blood and everything. No, he was just giving them guidance and instruction. The covenant is about what in this case? I'm not going to flood the earth. Because he's actually giving you more clarity here. He says, I will establish that covenant, and never again shall the flood, uh, flood cut them off in verse 11. And this is the sign of the covenant with you and me that is with you for all generations to come, that I'm going to set a rainbow in the cloud, and it's going to be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. 
So really is the stuff he said beginning in verse 1 through verse 11, I mean, super verse 9, is that actually part of the covenant? No, those are instructions. The covenant is I'm not going to flood the earth. Why did he flood the earth the first time? Because of the thoughts of man and their hearts was on evil continuously. There was Torah breaking. There was law breaking. There was commandment breaking. Oh, but they hadn't been given it yet. Well, no, they weren't formally given it yet. I promise you they were given it. And it was more than just don't eat of that tree. Because we see this with Cain and Abel when it comes to the offering, right? The offering where Cain should have known the right way to do it and Abel knew. How did he know? Because they had been instructed. So why was Cain in so much trouble? Because he just decided to ignore the instruction. Yeah, he says, well, if you do it right, won't you also be you know, considered a good boy? Basically, he said to him, right? You know how to do this. You just chose not to. And so you're in trouble because of your choices. So here he's saying, look, this is not a covenant where there's an expectation of anything. He's simply saying, I will never do this again, period. He doesn't say, as long as you do this, I will never do this again. Okay? So this covenant does not have a doing or not doing expectation. Does this covenant have anything to do in, in terms of Torah observance and law breaking and law keeping and all that? No. This is simply him saying, I have made a decision that I will never do this again. I've wiped everybody out. We're going to move forward. We're going to start again with you, Noah, and your children. And I'm going to make my covenant. When he says that, I think that we're talking about something a lot different. I'm going to make my covenant relationship with you and your seed. But I'm also in this covenant telling you I will never destroy the earth again, no matter what you guys do. Okay? That's why we know Yeshua shows up before we get to a place where there be no flesh left saved alive. Okay? But I'm not going to have floodwaters come never again to destroy the earth. So he has this covenant that he's establishing, and he's going to put a rainbow in the sky to remind as a reminder that he has this covenant. He says, so, and by the way, who's it supposed to remind? It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth and the rainbow shall be seen. He says, I shall remember my covenant. So what's the expectation that Yahweh has put here on the people? Nothing. Okay, there is no expectation of specified things to do or not do. I said, sometimes a covenant is simply Yahweh saying it to do what? To strengthen our confidence in a promise. Okay, this is a much more formal way of making a promise. I'm promising not to flood the earth again, but I'm actually going to covenant not to do it. Okay? He says, and I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, never again to let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. By the way, do the creatures keep Shabbat? Do they eat clean? Do they keep holy days? Do they? No, they don't do any of that stuff. So this has nothing to do with that part. And by the way, there can be more than one covenant. A covenant is simply a, a, a formal agreement between two parties with a specified expectation. In this case, the specified expectation is that we should expect Yahweh not to flood the earth. So he's imposed the expectation of doing and not doing on himself. It's not a two-way thing. He simply did that and said, I will not do this again. But by the way, that, is that covenant still valid today? Yes. Does that covenant have anything to do with the covenant made at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19? No. So we can have more than one covenant, but we're not looking at it in Christianese eyes. Well, there's the old covenant, which was done away with, and now the new covenant. Well, guess what? There's, mo there's lots of covenants. Some of them have to do with things like flooding the earth, which we just read about. Others have to do with expectations and our behavior towards each other and towards our creator. One has nothing to do with the other necessarily. So let's be careful. This is kind of like the whole idea that you were all taught that there's only one baptism. Well, no, there was going in the water for all kinds of reasons. If you read the Old Testament, if you read the, the Tanakh, you see that they, you touch a dead animal, you had to go in. You have your monthly cycle, you had to go in. You gave birth to a baby, you had to go in. You did this, this, or this, you had to go in the water. Lots of reasons to go in the water. But there's only need to go in the water once 
for a particular thing like covenanting. That only needs you to go once. Guess what? If you're working out in the, in the farm, in the wilderness, so to speak, you may deal with a dead animal on a regular enough basis. You're going to have to go in that water multiple times. It's not like one time and then no matter how many dead animals you touch, you're good. Every time it happens, you've got to do it. And that's just the way it works. Ladies had to do it every month, not once and then never again. And so let's understand this is another one of those things. We're going to learn that covenants can be multiple covenants for multiple reasons, and they don't necessarily have to do with each other. They're based on an individual particular thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So, I have a covenant with my wife. By the way, that covenant with my wife, to a larger or greater degree, really has nothing to do with the covenant made at Mount Sinai, that my wife and I are still both part of that one. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, there are certain aspects of my covenant with my wife that have to do with Sinai, because one of the things says don't commit adultery. Okay, so that part actually affects both covenants, doesn't it? But they're separate covenants that do have certain aspects that overlap. So let's understand, as we look at covenants, they may be separate, they may have some overlapping, but let's have to look at them as either there's one or the other and that's it. We all just agreed that the Noah covenant that was made here in Genesis 9 is still going forward. We're still in that covenant, us and every living creature on this planet. You do not have to be a, quote, believer. You don't have to be a part of any religious system. You don't have to be a part of even believing in the creator. You don't have to believe it doesn't matter what shape you think the earth is. It doesn't, none of those things matter. He has covenanted not to destroy it with a flood. Doesn't matter if you're a bird, a fish, a dog, a cat, a covenant is with all of them, all living creatures. And that covenant is still going on right now. And so let's, remember, we're changing our mindset to what Scripture actually says and is actually talking about. This is what we must be focused on. And so now let's continue. He says, and the rainbow, back in verse 15, I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and never again let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I shall see it to remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living creature of all flesh. So this is a forever covenant. Okay, forever covenant. And Elohim said to Noah, verse 17, this is the sign of the covenant which I established between me and all flesh that's on the earth. So this is not the Noahic covenant. This isn't one between him and Noah. This is between him and everybody. He just happens to be telling Noah about it because Noah kind of represents everybody at that point, except the creatures, right? But as far as the human beings, there's just Noah and the other seven people are on the boat, right? And so that's all you have. Now, so we have this covenant. Now let's go forward and look at chapter 12, okay? Let's look at chapter 12. I'm going to start looking at Abraham and promises made to Abraham. And in chapter 12, in verse 1, we're staying in Genesis here. Yahweh said to Avram, go yourself out of your land from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I show you. And I shall make you a great nation and bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I shall bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so here's a conditional promise. It's conditional on him going out. Okay, he says, Abram, go out. Now if you do that, of course Abram could have stayed. If you go out, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to be a blessing. Those who bless you shall be blessed. Those who curse you shall be cursed. So Abram left, verse 4. Smart man. Okay? As Yahweh had commanded him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out to Haran. I mean, excuse me, from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the beings whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set out of the land for the land of Canaan, and they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth trees of Moray at the time the Canaanites were in the land. And Yahweh appeared to Avram and said, To your seed I give this land. And he built there an altar to Yahweh who had appeared to him. 
And from there he moved to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and he built there an altar to Yahweh, and he called on the name of Yahweh. So now here he's giving another promise in verse 7, to your seed I give this land. So now we have several promises being made. And Avram, verse 9, set out continuing toward the south, and a scarcity of food came to be in the land, and Avram went down to Mitzrayim to dwell there, to Egypt, for the scarcity of food was severe in the land. And it came to be when he, uh, when he was close to entering Mitzrayim that he said to Sarai, his wife, See, I know that you are a fair woman to look at, and it shall be when the Mitzrites see you, and they shall say, Okay, so we're going forward here too far. I only wanted to go to verse 8, I guess. Okay? Um, so he's doing these things. Now, have we heard the word covenant yet? No. Yahweh's making some promises. Yahweh is making some promises. So we're going to learn again the difference between promises and covenanting, and we're going to see at certain points he's going to covenant to keep his promises. Verse, uh, chapter 13 and verse 14. Okay, here we're going to see the promises restated. Okay, and after Lot had separated from him, Yahweh said to Avram, Now lift up your eyes and look from this place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I shall give to you and your seed forever. He had said that in the previous chapter. And I shall make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then your seed also should, uh, could be counted. Arise, walk in the land, though it, through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Now, as we're looking at this, let's realize that as Yahweh clarifies promises, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's adding new things. Okay, he did say earlier in chapter 12 he was going to give all the land to Abram's seed. And now he's also helping, helping to understand in more clarity, by the way, your seed is going to be even like the dust of the earth. That's how much your seed is going to be. So he's giving more detail. It's not a new promise. He's just giving more detail about something. So let's continue now in chapter 15. So we've had the promises stated and restated here. In chapter 15, look at how this plays through in verse 7. And he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Master Yahweh, whereby I know that I possess it. I mean, after all, he's told him this now a couple of times, and he goes, well, how do I know that I possess it? And he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took all of these to him and cut them in the middle and placed each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. And it came to be when the sun was going down and a deep sleep fell upon Abram that see a frightening great darkness fell upon him. And he said, this is Yahweh said to Abram, now, excuse me, know for certain, know for certain. Remember, what was the question? How do I know? And now we're saying, well, this is how you're going to know. Know for certain that your seed are to be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years but the nation whom they serve, I'm going to judge, and afterward let them come out with great possessions. Now, as, as for you, you are to go to your fathers in peace. You are to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the crookedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to be when the sun went down and it was dark that see a smoking oven and a burning torch passing between those pieces." And the same day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, I have given this land to your seed from the river of Mitzrayim to the, river, the great river, the river Euphrates, with the Canaanite and the Canaanite and the Cadmonite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Rephaim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Yebusite. Okay, so he's made promises and promises up to this point, and now he's saying... By, by going through this process with the uh, offering of the animals, because a lot of times connected to covenants is the shedding of blood, and we see that here. But okay, but notice again, in this covenant, Yahweh said he's making this covenant, Abram, this covenant is to do what? Strengthen confidence in a series of promises. Who is obligated in this covenant? 
Yahweh. Is Abram obligated in any way? No. There's no expectation specifically specified of do's and don'ts for this covenant. This is simply, Abram was promised something. He was not understanding how he could have confidence in those promises. And so now we've turned it into a covenant. So covenant is a very serious term that was understood by the people in Abram's day. And so, and even in Noah's day, that meant this means it's, it's a done deal. You can take it to the bank, whatever idiomatic phrase you like to use. You have confidence in this. Okay? Now, some will say, well, the promise, the, the, this covenant has to do with everything, and therefore, you know, Abram wasn't really having to do anything. This shows how just like, you know, Jesus did it all for us. Well, here's, you know, Abba's, Abba's doing it all for us. Yahweh's doing it all for us because, after all, he's the only one that went through the fire, went through the, he went through the pieces, and made it a unilateral thing. Well, this was not about anything more than what? A covenant that his seed would get the land. This is an assurance of the promises. Let's not read into it what it doesn't say. Can we agree that it doesn't say more than that? Abram was concerned. He said, how do I know that I will possess this? You keep telling me I'm going to possess it. And by the way, at this point, I can understand where Abram's at, so maybe you can as well, because after all, he has not yet possessed it, and other people own it. Other people were dwelling on it. It's like, if, imagine I drove you by a piece of property with houses on it and stuff, and I kept telling you every few years, by the way, that's, that's going to be yours and your seeds. And yet, you still don't have it. And years later, you still don't have it. And years later, you still don't have it. And I was like, yeah, I keep hearing you say this, but how do I know? What does that mean? And, and so now, Abba's giving him more clarity. He says, look, you're not going to have it till after your seed ends up being in captivity and serving a nation. And then when they come out of there, they're going to have it. But you're not going to be a part of that. You're already going to live to a ripe old age, and you're going to go ahead and pass on. But it's your generational children's seed passed on after you. They're actually going to possess it. Because he hadn't really explained this to Avram. Avram's probably thinking, I'm going to go down and, you know, because after all, you took me out of the land I was living in. You're going to send me to some place and put me in a new place, and it's going to be a new place that's mine. Well, guess what? Abram never gets to have it be his. And he tells him that right here. He says, no, no, this is not the way it works. Let me explain to you how it's going to work. Your seed is going to inherit it after they have been in captivity for a period of time. And after I bring them out with impressive signs and wonders, and I bring them out and bring them back to here, then this will be theirs. You will be long gone by then. Could you imagine getting promises? And this is the hard thing for a lot of us, is to get promises that aren't for us now, but it's for our children's children's children. Why do you think that even in Yeshua's day and coming all the way to today, every generation has assumed and thought that they were going to be that last generation? Because if he didn't let you assume that, you wouldn't do what you need to do, thinking, well, what's the point? I'm not going to get to be the one. But you do it because you keep thinking it's going to be you. Does it make sense? That's part of the motivation. It's not the only reason, but it's part of the motivation. And so he allows that. But in this case, Avram was not getting it. He said, look, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to explain this. I'm going to have compassion. Avram, it's, you're, you're going to wander around. You're going to be moving from place to place. You are not going to end up in the land and have all of this be yours in your lifetime. It's going to be for your seed down the line. Now, of course, Avram's going to demonstrate later with Isaac that he gets the seriousness of his relationship and that he fully trusts in Yahweh. And Yahweh already knew this. So he didn't have a problem telling him, by the way, you don't even get to enjoy this. It doesn't happen in your lifetime. But Avram was so unselfish that that was fine with him. At least that's the impression we can get. He didn't mind that it wasn't going to be him. And so here we see a covenant, again, to strengthen promises. And Yahweh makes a covenant that's binding only Yahweh to fulfill his promises to Avram. Let's understand that that's what we see here. And this is still Avram. It's not even Avraham yet. It's Avram. Okay? And so we see that that's going on here in chapter 15. Now let's go to chapter 17. Okay? Chapter 17 in verse 1. And it came to be when Avram was 99 years old that Yahweh appeared to Avram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. 
Of course, the word perfect there is the word tamim. It has to do with walking in the fullness of integrity. It is not really to be interpreted here as never making any mistakes and being completely perfect. It's a bad translation. Nobody's capable of this. And so really, Avram would be the most frustrated human being having the Almighty himself. And that's what he said, I am El Shaddai, I am the Almighty. Okay? And now I want you to be perfect. Oh, gee, thanks a lot. I'm going to be now frustrated because that's not possible. No, what he said was, I want you to walk before me with integrity, with a full understanding that you're going to have integrity. What does integrity mean? That you do everything the best you can with the full effort, diligently, but when you fall short, you recognize it, you make teshuvah, you repent, you turn around, you get back on track. And you own what you do. You own it. That's integrity. Those of you out there that, are, that refuse, and there's a lot of you out there that refuse to own what you do, you have no integrity. Or limited integrity. I don't know if the, what the right term in there is for it. But it takes integrity to own your mistakes. It takes integrity to not blame others and point the finger and to make excuses See, why was David a man after Yahweh's own heart? The man had integrity. When he messed up, he owned it. He didn't push it off on anybody, didn't excuse it. He said, yep, I did that. I messed up, and I'm sorry, and I repent. And he did all the right processes. Have integrity. He says, walk before me. So in other words, the things that you do on a daily basis, the halacha, we call it halacha, the word there would be a, a form of the word holech or walk. And we call it halacha, the things that we do, the, 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 the law, the, the rules or regulations is often referred to as, as, as halacha. Well, really, it has to do with the things you do when you are walking this out. He says, I want you to walk this out before me. So we're doing it in front of him. Don't we all understand that he's watching? That everything you do is before him, it's in front of him? Well, we need to, I think, embrace this as something that's also a guidance for us. He's not talking to us here specifically. But I think that we can certainly embrace that there is a parallel in our lives that we walk before him, that we should ought to do it in, with integrity. He says, and I give my covenant between me and you and, that you, and, great, uh, and shall greatly increase you. Now remember, he had already given him his covenant to say that the promises I've been making to you will happen. He said, I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abram fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, as for me, look, my covenant was is with, with you and you shall become a father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Avram, but you shall be called Avraham because I shall make you the father of many nations. And I shall make you bear fruit exceedingly and make nations of you, and sovereigns shall come from you. Now let me point out here that when it says, I shall make you the father of many nations, the Hebrew word there is goyim. Okay, so goyim is not like a negative, or, or the word Gentile in the, you know, in the English would be Gentile. So we don't look down on Gentiles. Avram is supposed to be the father of many Gentiles. The goyim. It's not a negative sort of condescending term. It's just a status that you have when you're not in covenant. And what he's saying is that you're going to be the father of many of those that are in the goyim, and then they're going to come into covenant when they're no longer going to be goyim. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, go and listen to the teaching called Discovering Your Identity. All right? But your status was goyim. Now it's called Israel. And it has to do with this thing called covenant we're going to get to in Exodus 19. But right now we're still in Genesis. He says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to make you bear fruit exceedingly and make nations of you. And sovereigns or kings shall come from you. And I shall establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim to you and your seed after you. Okay, so now he's saying this covenant is not just a covenant about not flooding the earth like he said to Noah, which is still in effect here with Abraham, not just about your seed inheriting a piece of land or that you would be a father of nations, very specific things to Abraham. Now he's saying, look, I am covenanting also 
to between me and you, that I'm going to be Elohim to you and your seed after you. Now realize that this is kind of a strange statement to us because we're not living in a world of paganism where there's gods in everybody's house and idols everywhere all over the place. But back in these days, the idea of being your Elohim versus those other Elohim and et cetera, et cetera, this was an important thing for him to understand that they're not going to have Chemosh or Dagon or Baal. They're going to have me. This is between you and me and your seed. By the way, this is also why in the New Testament we read verses that say, if you are this, this, and this, then you are the seed of Abraham and part, and part of the covenant. You know what I'm talking about? We'll read those verses later in the teaching. Not today, but we'll get to those verses. I should have had it ready for today. But you know what I'm talking about because you are his seed by choice, not just by birth. Let's make sure that we understand that, that you are seed by choice, not just by birth birth. Give me a second. I may actually know where I want to go. Okay. In Galatians 3.29, it says, if you are of Messiah, then you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise, but also according to a covenant. Mm, you see a connection here. And thank you to the Ruach for giving me the verse real quick to go to in Galatians where I knew it would be. Okay. Galatians 3.29. So he says, look, I'm going to make, establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim to you and your seed. But there is something that determines whether or not you are, well, you don't need anything to determine whether or not you're Abraham. There was one and it was him and that's it. But what do you need to figure out what it means to be his seed? And that's what Paul's trying to explain in Galatians, what identifies you as seed of Abraham. Does it mean that you'd go over to Ancestry.com and figure out if you have his DNA? Well, that wasn't available to most people until recently. And even then, they couldn't tell you if you're Avraham's seed. How do you know? Well, it's going to have to do with choices, with actions, with decisions that we make. We can choose to be that seed. Let's continue here in verse um, 8. And I shall give to you and your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I shall be their Elohim. Now, by the way, notice it says an everlasting possession. Well, did they end up in the land forever? No. But do they still, quote, unquote, possess the land? Yes. So possession doesn't mean they're actually there because Abraham was promised it, that it was still his land, even though he wasn't on it yet. And this would be the seed of Avram's land, even if they're not always on it, because staying on it is a different part of another covenant. And in that covenant in Exodus 19, it says, and if you obey, you get to stay in the land. If you disobey, you get kicked out. It doesn't mean it's not yours anymore. You just don't get to be there. Does that make any sense? It might sound confusing, but understand possession, meaning it belongs to them but they just don't get to live on it. It's occupied land. Others were occupying the land. Of course, Israel's being accused of occupying other land now. So that's just, you know, it's kind of reversed. But the land was being occupied by all these ites, <laughs> okay, that we read about. But it still belonged to as a possession. It belonged to Abraham and his seed as soon as Yahweh said so. They just weren't going to get to occupy that land at that point. Now, of course, it would have been a little tough for Abram by himself when there's few people he had with him to just go occupy the land. Now, of course, when there were two or three million coming out of Egypt, now we got a whole other story in terms of occupying a land. And Elohim said to Abram, Okay, let's go back to verse 8. At the end of verse 8, it says, An everlasting possession, and I shall be their Elohim. And Elohim said to Avram, As for you, guard my covenant, you and your seed after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you guard between me and you. So now he's going to talk about a sign of the covenant, not just the covenant. There was a sign of the flood covenant. What was that sign? Rainbow. Rainbow. So this is another covenantal sign. This covenantal sign is about being seed of Abraham, being part of the family. 
He says, this is a covenant I'm going to, uh, this, um, this is my covenant with you garbage, he, me and you. Now, by the way, when he says that, he's not saying what follows is my covenant. The stuff that's previous is my covenant. Now he says, and you are going to do this as a sign of the covenant. You are going to take every male child among you and they're going to circumcise them. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Everything that had been said previously was the covenant, but this is going to be the sign of the covenant between Abraham and Yahweh. And, a, and, 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 their, and the generational children after that. And a son of eight days is circumcised by you, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with silver from any foreigner who is not your seed. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with the silver has to be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, his life shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. I know a lot of people get messed up by reading Acts chapter 15. But let's bear in mind, does anybody in Acts chapter 15 or anywhere in Acts have authority to change, alter, add to, or take away from Torah? No. Okay, so it doesn't really matter if we understand or don't understand Acts 15. We know what they can't be doing is saying that you're no longer required to get circumcised. Why do we know that? Because it's an everlasting covenant of being Abraham's seed. So all of you men out there that are still wanting to fight, argue, debate, make excuses, knock it off. Or cut it off. <laughs> Or cut it out. Well, normally I would say knock it off or cut it out. Well, cut it out. It says, his life shall be cut off from his people. You don't want to cut off the foreskin. Well, you're going to get cut off. Stop arguing about this. There's only one valid excuse and this has come up in our discussions before, for not getting circumcised if you want to be covenanted. You don't want to be covenanted. You don't have to do anything. The covenant has an expectation of performance, do's and don'ts. He's saying this is a sign of a covenant, which, by the way, he said this covenant is between who? <coughs> Abraham and his seed forever. This is not just a between him and Abraham thing. This is between him and and all the generations forward. So let's understand, as we're looking at this, this covenant that's between him and Abraham and his seed going forward, okay, and we want to make excuses and we want to spin this and that because you don't want to do what you don't want to do. But there's an expectation of performance here. Don't claim you're covenanted if you don't have the sign of the covenant. Here's the only valid exception. If you happen to be in a health condition where it would be life-threatening to do it. There are some people, especially when they're older, and they're on all kinds of blood thinners, and they've got all kinds of other issues, all kinds of heart, you know, heart disease and other things like that, right? That where they really would be to go in surgery like that, because they'd have to come off the thinners to do it, so it would clot. It's a health risk. I mean, like serious, like life-death risk. That's the only exception to the rule. If you're healthy enough to do it, you need to do it. And, I, and I, I'm tired of people arguing and making excuses and everything else. All right? And don't give me this, all the websites saying it's abuse and this and that and the other thing. That's what you always find from the opposition to anything. They're always going to attack and accuse it as being evil and horrible and this and that and the other thing. All right? I can also introduce you to people who didn't circumcise their children and their children ended up with all kinds of bacterial and other infections and stuff, and it is not good. It is ugly, okay? There's a reason why in the U.S., back in the 60s and stuff, they just started doing it automatically for everybody. They don't do that necessarily anymore, but they used to because there was health issues, okay? So keeping that whole area clean is not simple as it might sound, especially expecting a kid to do it. And a kid can't do it when they're a little baby, which means you have to do it. And guess what? Mom, you may not want to be doing that. Because that isn't a pleasant thing to necessarily have to deal with. Of course, if your baby gets circumcised on the eighth day, there's no issue. 
And let's not go into this whole, well, well, back in the original days, they just snipped off a little bit. Where are you getting these articles from? Back in the original days. Okay? Our brother Jude has been doing this longer than anybody. They are, they're the ones who maintain the sign of the covenant. And they cut the whole thing off, thank you very much. So don't tell me you can find articles arguing with that. And when David went and killed all the Philistines and came back, right, with his bag full of foreskins or whatever he did, it wasn't these tiny little slivers of pieces. He took off the foreskins. I know you don't like this conversation. Oh, but you always tell all your friends how you just want the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me, blah, blah, blah. Do you? Then go get circumcised. But you're wanting me to go let, well, yeah, when you're eight days old, you don't think about all that. So sorry for you that your mother didn't do it and your father didn't do it when you were a kid. So now you got to actually make that decision as an adult. Well, you know what? That makes the decision all that more powerful and meaningful. Because I can promise you, I was circumcised on the eighth day and I remember none of it. <laughs> and I had no choice. I have a nice little certificate that the rabbi gave my parents. If you ever come by my house, I could show it to you. <laughs> okay? But, but the point is, no, I don't have the foreskin to show you, just the certificate. <laughs> I know you were, I know where you were going with that. No, I just, I don't have that. It's in formaldehyde in a jar in my, in my house. Okay, now that we've completely gone off the rails here. But I knew I felt like I was end up going to be a little preachy today. Look, either you're in or you're out. If you're in, that means you are covenanted. Not a believer, not saved, not all this other stuff, but covenanted. What does the covenant expect of you? It expects you to be circumcised or you're not in the covenant. So get it done. Some of you never did your children. Well, fine. You know what? They get too old to just go ahead and do that. Then you have to let them wait till they're old enough to do it themselves and make their own choice. Okay? But I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm tired of the arguing. And some of you will want to go in the water to get mikvahed when you turn 20. And some of you, I already know for a fact, we did that with and you weren't circumcised. Well, guess what? You're not any more covenanted. You're now you're just wet and uncovenanted. Ooh. Yeah, that hurts. Oh, oh, see, I told you you weren't going to like me today. The water didn't covenant you. Show me the verse that says the water covenants you. Show me one verse that tells you you need to go in the water to be covenanted. Is there a verse? Anybody know of one? But here's one that says you got to be circumcised to be covenanted. Ladies, you're luckily for you, you don't have to deal with any of this stuff. Because you know why? Because you are covenanted as a part of a man. You're covenanted as a part of your father or your brother or the leadership that you're under. But the man has to show it a sign and he has to be covenanted. And let's stop arguing this. Oh, but in Acts 15, well, look, you know what Acts 15 was about? It was about a Jewish community that didn't like Gentiles coming into that community. Because let's not think for a second that Christianity started and Judaism was a different thing. No, there was no Christianity. There was believers in Messiah who were Jews. And then there were Gentiles that were coming into that. All the original believers, followers, were Jews. There were covenanted Jews who believed that Messiah had come. And there were covenanted Jews that believed the Messiah hadn't come. That was the difference in the groups. And there were Gentiles wanting to join the group that believed the Messiah had come. And the Jews weren't thrilled having a bunch of Gentiles coming into their group. And so I know, uh, they're thinking, I know how we can keep that from happening. Tell them they got to get circumcised first. Anybody interested in first learning Torah by having to get circumcised first? Or do you make that decision as a fruit of your Torah study? So what did James say? Yaakov said... I'm going to rule that because they're going to hear Moses preached in the synagogue every Shabbat, let them just abstain from these four things while they're learning, and then when they learn, they can choose to covenant. 
The Jews are trying to use covenant, the circumcision, as the way to keep them out by scaring the you-know-what out of them, saying, oh, no, you can't even come and learn what we're talking about unless you circumcise first. No, I'm sorry. I'm not signing up for that. You know, am I, are we in agreement here? We understand? And so you understand the brilliance of Yaakov's point was, no, 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 stop making a, a problem with them coming to services. Now, the four things that he told them to not do, what were those four things? The four things they would do going to a pagan temple. So he basically said, look, while they're coming to the synagogue, I'm going to create a, a, a process that will prevent them from going to the pagan temple. What did it say? Okay, he says, so you're not going to go and do anything with idols. So avoid idolatry. You're going to avoid the uh, prostitution, okay, the sexual misconduct, because when you went to a pagan temple, there was pagan, uh, the temple prostitutes. Okay, things strangled. They would strangle an animal. And things of the blood, drinking the blood, because they would strangle the animal, and then you would drink the blood. These were all common practices in the pagan temples in the days after Messiah had been resurrected, and they were trying to make this decision in Acts 15. He says, the next verse then says, because every, you know, there are synagogues everywhere, and in them, Moses is being preached. And these people are going to learn Moses. And then if they agree to come into covenant, they'll circumcise. Some of them are going to walk out and not stay. So do we need everybody to get circumcised who's just going to come in and after a while say, this isn't for me? And now they made a sign in the flesh that's not valid? Why do we need them to make a sign in the flesh until that flesh, what is, what's the sign in the flesh? A sign of what? Covenanting. Were these people in Acts 15 covenanted yet? No. They just were interested in what was being taught. And they wanted to come and learn and see if it was something they wanted to covenant with. And then once they saw it and they liked it and they, they wanted to commit their lives to it, they would now have to get the sign of the covenant in their flesh. Most of you come from that background. You're Gentiles by background, by birth, by bloodline. Okay, and you want a covenant to be grafted in. Well, you need the sign of the covenant. Okay, no Torah has been done away with, ever. Torah is valid always. Because people like to ask me this question all the time. Well, how much of the Old Testament transferred forward into the New? Um, all? Is there a part that you have a problem with not, not one jot or tittle shall pass away? Is there a problem with that there's no adding or taking away from this law? Is there a problem with these things will be statutes for my people and their seed after them forever throughout their generations? What part of that is confusing? We're talking about covenant here. Are you just believing in a lot of stuff? Or are you going to covenant it? Commitment is what covenant's about. You are committing to your life to this agreement. It's a formal life commitment. Same as a marriage, a formal life commitment. And so here we are covenanting, and there's a sign of that covenant being talked about here. Now listen, as he continues, he says... In verse 15, and Elohim said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, do not call her Sarai, but Sarah is her name, and I shall bless her and also give you a son by her, and I shall bless her and she be shall become nations, sovereigns of peoples who are going to come from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed, said in his heart, is a child born to a man 100 years old? Now bear in mind, how old was he when he started out on this journey? So 25 years has gone by. He was 75. He's now 100. Okay? And so for 25 years, he'd been hearing, this land's going to be yours and your seeds. Was it his yet? No. 25 years is a long time, and you haven't received something. That's why this is going on as a covenant thing to say, look, no, no, no. You know, when we go back even to chapter uh, 15, when we have this covenant being made, when he says, look, don't, you know, don't worry about this. This is going to happen in the future generations. He's been waiting a long time, but, he's already, but he already knows now that he's not going to get it in his lifetime. But then again, he hasn't had any children. He's told, man, you're going to be the father of all these nations. Father of nations, I haven't had one. I'm going to be the father of nations. I haven't had one kid. Don't I need to start out with at least one? And maybe if I only have one, then he'll have a whole bunch, and they'll have a whole bunch. It'll start, you know, multiplying out there. Verse 18, and Abraham said to Elohim, oh, let Ishmael live before you. Because he's thinking, well, that's crazy. I'm 100 years old. What do I need to start having kids now? 
Look, I'm 55. I'm not sure I'd want a baby right now. Okay, start all over again with diapers and all that stuff at 55. Okay? Hey, listen, I don't mind holding your baby. But then when I start to feel like something's going on, I give them right over to you. <laughs> oh, by the way, here's your baby back. Okay, I changed diapers. You can ask my wife. I changed plenty. A lot of husbands don't. I did. I took care of all that. But I don't think I want to do it now. He was 100. So he says, well, let Yishmael live before you, because Yishmael he had with him. And Elohim said, no. Wait a minute. Elohim, let's start off with Elohim said, no. Sometimes Elohim says no. That's hard for some people. And here he says, no. Sarah, your wife, is truly bearing a son to you, and you shall call his name Yitzchak, and I shall establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seeds after him. So he's saying, look, I'm going to transfer all this stuff to Yitzchak. And notice he tells him already what you're going to call your kid. Call him laughter. <laughs> because you laughed. And by the way, for all of you who think I'm so serious all the time, my Hebrew name is Yitzchak. So there you go. Joke's on you. Okay. Or on me, I guess. I don't know. But my Hebrew name is, is Yitzchak, uh, which is a name. Often in, in, with Jewish children, modern day, we'll have an English name and a Hebrew name. And the Hebrew name is often connected to a relative or somebody else that you could be named after or something. So it's not always trying to figure out how to take your English name and figure it out into Hebrew. Sometimes it's easy, like if your name is Joseph and you can go for Yosef. But, you know, for me, there wasn't just an easy Stephen. Stephen doesn't really have a, a Hebrew name directly connected to it. But I had a great-grandfather whose name was Isaac. And so Yitzchak Isaac was, so I was named after him. But anyway, um, that has nothing to do with any of this. Okay, so continuing verse 20. Well, how far did I want to go with this? Let me look at the chapter number 22. Okay. So in 20, it says, As for Ishmael, I have heard you. See, I shall bless him and shall make him bear fruit and greatly increase him. He is to bring forth 12 princes, and I shall make him a great nation. But my covenant, my covenant I established with Yitzhak, whom Sarah is to bear to you at this time next year. And when he had ended speaking with, uh, with him, Elohim went up from Abram. Now, you'll notice there's a, there's a pattern here that when Elohim's finished, there's no more talking. We'll see this also with the Sodom and Gomorrah thing. You know, if you, we're not going to do that today or in this teaching series. But if you ever go back and look at the Sodom and Gomorrah thing, it says that Abram goes back and forth with him for a while. But notice that when it says that when Elohim was done, when Yahweh was done, conversation ended and he went on. He only allowed Abram to go up to a point. And then when it was over, it was done. It says here, it says that when Elohim, when, you know, it says when Yahweh was done, that was it. Okay? Now, when he refers to things like my covenant, I think sometimes he's talking about the covenant. And we can see how that hints at it. He says, my covenant, which I made with Adam, and then my covenant I passed on to Noah, my covenant, which I'm now passing on to you, which I'm going to have you pass on to Isaac, this covenant, I think, also includes, I'm going to jump there now just real quickly. If we go to chapter 26, just to get an idea of it, I want to jump there real quickly. It says here, now this is promises being made in chapter 26. We're talking about Yitzchak. He says, and we'll look at verse 4. It says, I shall increase your seed like the stars of the heaven. I shall give you these lands to your seed. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Same problem as of Abraham. But why? Because Abraham obeyed my... Well, wait a minute. Was Abraham told to obey anything up to this point? No. He wasn't given any instruction that we could read about. He obeyed my voice, guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, my Torah tie. Now, I know it says Torah in your scriptures because the geniuses at ISR don't know Hebrew, I guess. I don't know. But Torah would sound like it's the plural of Torah, but he says Torah tie in Hebrew means the Torah that's mine. My Torah, my laws, my instructions. So apparently Abraham had instruction beyond what we've seen here. Laws, right, rulings, commandments. Oh, well, don't we see that a lot after Moses? Right, starting with Moses forward, we keep reading, guarding my charge, my laws, my commandments, my right rulings, my judgments. We read about the Mishpatim and the Chukim and all these other things that, are, that we read about in the New Testament, I mean, in, uh, starting with the Mos Mosaic Covenant or the Moses time in Exodus. 
But here, even Abraham had the same understandings, apparently. That's, you know, that's something that we really need to understand as we go through all of this. Let's see if we can squeeze one more thing in here. Go to chapter 22. Okay. So in chapter 22, and we're dealing with the Akedah here, the offering of Isaac. We're going to read verse 15. And the messenger of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time from the heavens and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son. Now notice what he says here. I have sworn by myself because of what Abram did. So this, there are some connections sometimes with action and response between us and our creator. He says, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, that I shall certainly bless you and I shall certainly increase your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and let your seed possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. He made a covenant unilaterally earlier. So why is he saying now it's because you obeyed my voice? Well, I, can we all go to that their father and the, that we, when we're dealing with Yahweh, that he knows the end from the beginning? That time is irrelevant. He sees all things at all times as being the same. Do you, do you think maybe when he made the covenant and promise, he knew Abraham would do this? That's why he picked Abraham? Because he already knew the choices he would make? But now we're seeing why he would he, why, this is a good question. Until this moment, why would he give all of this great stuff to Abraham? What would made Abraham so great? Why did he pick this guy? We can't look at things that way because we know all these stories already. We've read the whole accounts. It's like every time you read about, you know, Israel by the sea, you're all thinking, well, of course he's going to part the sea. It's hard for you to think and read that as if you didn't know what was going to happen. Could you imagine reading that story the first time you ever could have read it, not knowing how that would have been the most exciting story you could have ever read? And here they are, and the armies are coming behind them, and there's mountains on one side and the sea on the other, and what's going to happen? Boy, that would have been just like... I mean, so, I mean, the anxiety level and the, the intensity. But you read it knowing exactly what's going to happen, so you don't think of it that way. So we don't ask the silly question, which seems like a silly question now, but it would have been a great question if we had thought of it. When he first goes to Avram and says, or actually he wasn't even Avram yet, he was Avram, and says, all this stuff I'm going to promise you. Well, why him? Why, because he got up and left Chaldees? The Ur of the Chaldees, and he, and he left? And just because I told you to leave and he left, that's why he's giving all this stuff to Avram? No, because he understood already what kind of man he was dealing with. He knew the choices he would make. He knew the end from the beginning. Can we understand that now? He knew, Genesis 26, that Abram would keep all of his commandments and laws and guard all these things. His charge, obey his voice. Ah, isn't that what we read in Exodus 19? If you agree, that's covenantal language, to obey my voice, all the words coming out of my mouth, wasn't well, that what it said in Genesis 26? It said, Abraham obeyed, it says here, obeyed my voice and guarded my commands. This is what the covenant's all about. So let's now see, because what's happening here in 22, when he offers up Isaac, he says, because you have obeyed my voice, verse 18, I'm going to keep all these promises. Whoa, 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 whoa. You already made an unconditional covenant that you were going to keep these promises. But now we understand, because time doesn't work for Yahweh like it works for us. He made those promises and covenants to Abraham knowing this was going to happen. And so he made those promises because of this in advance. Wow. Okay? He covenanted with Abraham in advance because of the obeying of his voice. Even though it hadn't happened yet. So there still was a relationship and a doing and a not doing and a, and a kind of a demonstrating of submission that brought the promises to Abraham in the first place. It's not like the Christians want you to understand, well, he just, uh, because he believed, whatever that means. Well, yeah, I believe it absolutely was that he was caught according to righteousness because he believed. Belief is an action, not a thought. It's not an emotion. 
Here was one of those actions. He believed Yahweh and did what he said, trusting that it was going to work out somehow. And we read that in Hebrews 11 anyway, when it says, did not Abraham, through his belief, offer up his son? Was not belief an action at that point? That's, that's what the right of Hebrews says. And so then it was accorded to him as righteousness. It's not just because he believed Yahweh said or believed in what Yahweh's promises. He demonstrated belief through action. And we see that in Genesis 26 when it says that these promises are going to now be passed on to Isaac. And by the way, they were not passed on to Isaac because of a covenant with Isaac. They were passed on because he promised Abraham he would pass them on to Isaac. And because of what Abraham did, not because of what Isaac did. But so when we read this now, he doesn't change He's not changing what he said earlier. He's saying, well, I, I, all your seed and, uh, and in all your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. It was always because he obeyed the voice. None of this stuff happens unless he said to him, go out, and he went out. We started that in chapter, uh, chapter 12, right? He said, go out, and if he didn't go out, none of this, we wouldn't be reading any of this stuff. But he went. He obeyed the voice. So why did he get covenanted? Why Abraham was picked? Because he obeyed vo the voice of Yahweh. What's the covenant in Exodus 19 that we're all grafting into? Those who would obey the voice of Yahweh and trust that what Yahweh says works. That's what a covenant's all about. It's all about obeying his voice. What made Noah so special? He knew Noah would do what? Build the ark. Come on now, how many of you, if you were, heard a voice tell you to build an ark in the middle of dry land in, a bunch, in front of a bunch of people that are going to mock you for, and it took them a long time to build that ark, okay? I don't remember the math on it, but it's a long time, okay? Okay, so we're talking about for years he was being laughed at. So he heard a voice and obeyed the voice and he built the ark. That's why he was picked, not just because he built the ark, but because he was one who would obey the voice of Yahweh. So the covenant has a, a pattern that we're seeing going across. The pattern is those that would obey his voice. And so are you one of those that would obey his voice? Are you one that he could look at that you would do in, in chapter 26 here? And we're going to wrap up back in 26. Okay. In 26, it says there was a scarcity of food, verse 1, besides the scarcity of food that was in the days of Abraham. And Yitzhak went to Avimelech, sovereign of the Philistines, and Gerer. And Yahweh appeared to him and said, Do not go to Mitzrayim. Live in the land which I command you. Sojourn in this land, and I shall be with you and bless you. For I give you all these lands to you and your seed, and I shall establish the oath which I swore to Abraham. So I'm going to establish this covenant with you that I swore to your father Abraham. And I shall increase your seed like the stars of heaven. I shall give you all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham obeyed my voice and guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah. That's why. And don't we see that Isaac is going to be the same? He's going to obey the voice. And then Yaakov is going to obey the voice. Now, they don't necessarily do it right away. They have, sometimes we see verses and places where they have to learn to obey the voice. But eventually they get there, or they get to it right away, but they're obeying the voice. That's what it's all about. Amen? I know that was a lot of information. But it is very crucial to know what covenant it is. Why we're in covenant. Why it is that we cannot do the things that we once did. Things that the world does, such as Halloween, uh, Christmas, Easter. And soon enough, I think in two weeks, because next week we are doing Praise and Thanksgiving. Two weeks we're going to be talking about Thanksgiving and the reason why us believers should not do it. Um, there's a lot to it that is just, um, it's a mess. It's a big mess. It's a disaster, <laughs> basically what it is. Um, and Brother Derek will talk more about that. Um, there's a few things that I want to talk about that was in that covenant agreement between two or more parties by saying father by saying Yahuwah I follow you 
Simon and myself to you, you have just entered into a covenant. There are conditions to every covenant. Just like we sign a contract. You buy a new car, you buy a new laptop, you buy something new, you, you get a new home, whatever it may be, get a new job. You have a contract that you sign and the contract says what you can and what you cannot do. The interesting thing about that is that when it comes to contracts in life, we're not really worried about the consequences about getting out of those because, well, they'll, they'll pass. If I break contracts, I'll, I'll suffer for a little bit and then I'll get right back and I won't have, a, I won't have to bother. The issue with that is that we take that and we apply it to father. Oh, I broke covenant. It's okay. He, he forgives me. Hey, I, 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 I've already asked for forgiveness and the, the, whatever the meaningless stuff that is out there that, that, that Christianity or uh, Christianity, I should say, teaches. But the problem is, is that we don't understand is that the difference between a contract here on earth and the, con and the contract that we sign with Father is that Father can take our lives and we, we don't think about that. We don't think about the fact that our lives is him to is is his to claim whenever he wants to. As I was saying before, and Derek says all the time, I could drop dead right now. I can drop dead in my sleep. I can drop dead tomorrow. Whatever it is, it's up to him. And I should praise him no matter what. But I need we need to assess, I need to assess and well we need to assess everything that happens in our lives up to this point. And say, if I were to leave right now, if he were to say, that's it, no more, I'm taking you right now, are we going to be in a good place to go? Also, the consequences, there's consequences, Deuteronomy 28. Uh, let's see. Wrote that, wrote that, wrote that, wrote that, wrote that. Let's see. How could we expect Father to walk with us if we do not agree to what he tells us to do? Covenant is about walking with him. How can we walk with him if we say it's done away with? How can we walk? How can he walk with us if we say we're no longer under that? It's a burden to me. I'm over here and I'm under grace. He's walking that way, and I'm standing over here. He's not walking with me. If I, if we, if we proclaim that, if we say that, it, we, me and Jeanette were talking and during it, and it, 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 he talks about how, how hard people, how hard it is for people to come out and say, "How am I supposed to tell my parents? How am I supposed to do this? How am I? What am I supposed to tell them?" And I made the comment, by society standards, it is easier for someone to come out and say that they're gay than it is for them to come out and say that they're, they're going to be obedient to, to Yahuwah and obey Torah. They get far more consequences from their family. They get far more uh, hate from their family for being obedient Rather than being sinful. I ain't that backwards. So you decide. And I, I had this happen to me. I remember my mom told me, what happened to my son? I was like, what? The one that was always sleeping with women? The one that was always a drug addict? The one that was always drinking? You miss him? Oh, I don't. That was bad. I, mm. It's just, it's rather interesting. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. What else say? Oh, I love the point that he made. The fearful and awesome day of Yahuwah. Everybody's like, I can't wait for that day. And I was that person. I kind of still am because it's going to be crazy when it happens. 
but what he said actually changed my opinion about it. It is the worst time to come. The absolute worst time, the most pain, the most grief, the most suffering that is ever going to happen it is the absolute lowest point this earth will ever see. It is not an awesome day. It is not a day that you want to look forward to. We will be protected, but it's still not a day that we want to look forward to. What happens after is what we want to look forward to. I don't want to... I, I don't want to... No. We don't believe in... The pre-trib rapture here. And easily disproven. It's really easily disproven. Exodus alone is, a, is the proof that we need to show that father will still have the turmoil and all the all the things happen while he protects his people so we believe in the post trip whatever happens it's just not the pre-trip it's going to be awesome to see him protect us but i just I don't want to see every all that turmoil, all that pain happen, and everything. It's gonna be it's gonna be intense. Seeing everybody suffer, it's gonna take a toll on us. And because of that, it could turn it could cause people to turn away. Actually, I'm not gonna say it could. It will cause people to turn away because of seeing all that pain, all that sorrow. How can how can a loving God do this? The worst part about it is that it's going to be Christians who do that. It's going to be Catholics who do that. It's going to be Baptists and Methodists and all these other people who are part of religion. Who have been lied to. They're going to turn away. Um, let's see. Oh. Um, so he talks about Israel being in the land and how there how there were there are many who claim that land and how now they are accused of taking the land from others so you got palestine and that whole accusation that's going on right now my question is should they even be in the land did father call them back to that land I would argue no. And the reason why is because if Father called them back to the land, wouldn't they be obedient to his word? Wouldn't they be keeping the Torah better than anybody else in the entire world? And wouldn't they be shining so bright because of their obedience? The answer is yes. Second thing is if they were called to the land, why is Tel Aviv the gay capital of the Middle East and actually that side of the world, really? Tel Aviv has more homosexuality in it than anywhere out on that on the eastern side of the seaboard. Why do they call it a seaboard? That doesn't make any sense. Side note, sorry. If they were called back to the land, the land would be at peace. Leviticus talks about that. It would be enjoying its Sabbaths. Leviticus talks about that. If they were called back to the land, they would be obedient people. Jeremiah, Ezekiel talk about that. Isaiah talks about that. That's not what is going on right now. Not until... Father Yahushua comes back. Are they? Are we supposed to be called back to the land? That's when he gather, gathers his the scattered sheep. And uh, I think the last thing I want to say, which actually, I, actually, yeah, giving our opinion about scripture. When it's contrary to scripture. So if I see scripture and I give my opinion, but it goes against that. Well, you know, that's not for me. 
I, I'm just gonna use the normal like Christian Christianese talk or whatever. That's how you interpret it. That's that's not for me. That that's for you type of thing. You are talking back to Yahuwah. I don't I forget what triggered that thought and what he said, but having that thought process is like talking back to your parents. And what happens when you talk back to your parents? Chancla! Oh, we had a whole thing about Chancla. Woo! That was hilarious. Um you get smacked. You get disciplined. <laughs> There's consequences of talking back to him. But yet, we just don't believe that Yahuwah will ever do something like that. What? 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 What will cause? My, uh, this has been a question that I've constantly asked myself. Now I see many people out there who are obedient to Torah, who who are proclaiming Torah. And I, I see a bunch of people out there that are um, say they're followers and just 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 doing what we're doing. But yet I cannot help but ask. As I see their lives and, and how they treat others or how they actually are or just just the type of person that they are. I mean, I can't help but ask it because they don't they I see them struggle with so many things and everything. It's just what will it get what will people have to do or what will father end up doing to them in order to understand that they can't be doing what they're doing. They think that what they're doing is perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with it, but yet not only do they, are they hurting themselves, they're hurting people around them. No, there's a list of things that, that go into that category. I thinking that you're you're when you talk Torah, you're speaking the word and everything, but yet you have a potty mouth, but yet you have you talk down to people, you mock people, whatever it may be, you might be speaking Torah and everything, but yet you're still selfish and you're prideful or uh, that's a big it's a big list. Sometimes people just don't understand and don't see what they're what they're going through. And that's why we need our brothers and sisters to help us. It's so crucial that we need our brothers and sisters because as Paul says, and I, I taught this when I when I was going through, I think, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul stated that he cannot judge himself because every time that he looks at himself, he'll judge himself on the curve. Oh, I'm not, I'm not that bad. That person's worse than me. Look what they have done. You're comparing yourself to someone else who is sinful. Put yourself against Yahusha. You are not a good person. I am definitely not a good person. The only person that, it, as Yahusha says, because Peter called him good, and he said, who are you calling good? How do you know I'm good? There's only one that's good, and that's from Father. But Peter recognized that, I think it was Peter, um, I might be misquoting. Forgive me if I am. Well, I should just say the person. The person who said it knew and re recognized that he was from Father. He was from Yahuwah. So that's the reason why he called him good. The only thing that can be considered good is the Torah. And Yahusha was the living embodiment of the Torah. Therefore, he was good. He was the representation of good. Put our lives against that. And then judge yourself to see whether you're good or not. Whether you are you need to fix things or whatever. Sometimes we can't do that. And then we need our brothers and sisters. So, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know I did. Um, with those, that those were just part one and part two. Um, I believe... He is in part six or seven. He might have done part seven today. There's a lot of teachings. Um, there's a lot of information that he gives. And he just, he's, he's just going through each of the books and going, going, going until he gets to the Renew Testament. He's going to end up going through the Renew Testament as far as what is covenant. And he's going to prove why Torah says covenant and why the Renew Testament supports 
that covenant. He's going to uh, he most likely will break down Paul and Yahushua and Peter and uh, John and and show why covenant never stopped. I really hope he gets to Galatians because Galatians is the trap that Christianity has placed amongst everybody who believes in Torah because they because it is the most misinterpreted thing. But what's interesting is that Peter in 2 Peter yeah, Second Peter, he's talking to the Galatians and says, foolish Galatians, or not foolish Galatians, Paul says foolish Galatians in, in chapter 3, but in First Peter 3, he says, be careful when you hear and you listen and you walk and you, you read Paul, because if you're not well learned, if you're not walking correctly, you will twist and skew the scriptures isn't what Paul says about Torah to your own demise and that's exactly what Christianity is doing that's what exactly what religion is doing right now now when I I want to make a statement because this is this is actually something that has come up um, in groups that I am part of when I speak about Christianity I am not talking about individuals. Now, fortunately, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll save that until after I'm done explaining. I'm not talking about individuals. I am talking about the religion, the doctrine, the theology as a whole. Everything that it encompasses, not the individuals, not the persons, just what is taught, the false teaching that it is. Unfortunately, because people are identified with that, they take it as a shot. They take it as an accuse, they are accusation. They take it as um, an offense towards them and me and, and hatred. I don't mean it as hatred. I don't mean it. I'm. I'm just proclaiming as far as what the word says compared to what doctrine and dogma says. It's, it's what we do here. Every time we stand up here, we talk, we compare what the world has been taught compared to what the truth is. There can only be one truth. And if this says this, but father says this, we cannot go with man. There's twice it says, do not trust man. In Psalms, it says, don't, don't trust man. Test, test what man says. Stop listening to him because what he says could be skewed. And then Paul says in Thessalonians, test everything. But yet when we get to that test everything thing, 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 thing. for some reason that sounded really weird. When we get to that test everything verse, how dare we test the theologians, the scholars, and those people of this time. It's almost like they despise you for having a thought. I, I've dealt with this. Actually, I still deal with this. So don't be afraid to test everything. That's exactly what we do here. We test everything that we've ever heard. We put it against scripture. And if scripture proves it wrong, scripture is right, dogma, doctrine is wrong, we throw that out and we we do what Yahusha praised the Ephesians for in Revelations. We expose the false teaching. So don't think that I'm accusing or attacking Christians. Uh, that is not what my heart intent my heart's intent is or what I'm trying to proclaim. It's just Showing where the lies and where the false teachings are. If you have, if there's an issue, please contact me. Please contact me. Or take what I said and, and see if it's true. You have the you have a, a scripture right there. Well, you should. I know we have. Well, fifteen in our house. Everywhere. It's like you know you know when a, a pregnant wife hides cookies everywhere. 
That's how we are with scriptures. I like cookies. I like cookies. You had nachos. <laughs> Pull nachos out of the cabinet in the ca- in the. <laughs> Anyways, so I hope you guys enjoyed the teaching. Um, teachings, teaching, whatever you want to look at it. Covenant. I understand that covenant is a big deal. It's not about belief. It's about covenant because without covenant, how can we have belief? So I would advise everybody to also check out MTOI's uh, other videos on covenant. Um, I will put them in the link below. I can say that now. I will put them in the link below or show the uh, the playlist in which they are in. So you guys can go there and, and, and uh, watch what is left or what the other ones are going on and keep up weekly as he continues uh, to go through them. So uh, I think that's it for right now. As we do every time, it is time for praise and thanksgiving. So get up, stand up, stretch. And get ready to praise because, well, as you say in the very beginning, I sing praises to you, O Most High.
ביחד, נשיר את השיר הזה, אם תעמדו בדברים.
better recognize your booty is back The train is coming, get off the tracks Nothing compares to your love, yeah Everything that we've been through Sold away and now we're made new Yahusha's risen, we all redeemed Lift your voice and sing with me Nothing compares to your love, yeah
That last song. Just want to point out. You're the everlasting king. You have come to set me free. You have broken every chain that once held me. Now. Where does freedom lie? Does freedom lie in not having rules? Does freedom lie in being able to do everything you want? Does freedom lie into making whatever decisions you desire to make? And the like. Or Does freedom lie when you live within a certain parameter and you're able to do certain things and those things that you're not able to do are things that end up hurting you and destroying you and damaging you. Now, when Paul talks about the chains that are upon us in Romans, He's talking about the chains that sin has caused. The chains that we've accumulated because of our sins. In order to break the chains, we have to turn away from what caused those chains, caused us to grab those chains and put them on our shoulders or to shackle them around our wrists or ankles or legs, whatever it may be, and put them around our waist. Only one way to do that. And it's obedience to him. And I know I can speak for I hope I can speak for everybody in here and Brother Derek and what we who we are as a as a as a community, I should say that, congregation. We've never felt more freer once we came under the obedience of Torah. Trust in him with all your heart and lean on our own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That is what everything's about. Trusting in him. Leaning on him. Helping him. Helping him. Him helping us understand the true way. So I guess I hope you guys enjoyed that crazy Thanksgiving. I know we did. We always do. It's always a fun time here. So if we may, please maybe bow, just give thanks and praise him. Avina Makano, our Father, our King, Father, we praise you, we glorify you, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for being able to come before you and give this day back up to you, the Shabbat. I know the sun's gone down already, and yet we are in now the first day of the week. But technically, by uh, all these standards that we have in the world, oh, we do this, we do that. We're still in your Shabbat. We want to stay in your Shabbat rest. We want to be able to, to just not let your presence leave us. And Father, death is not a fun thing. Death is not a good thing, nor should we praise it at all. And what I mean by this is, Father, recently, just actually this morning, there was a shooting of over in Pittsburgh of in a synagogue, and 11 were dead. Father, it is for us to do something, for man to do something like that, it is so hateful, it is so disturbing, it is so bad. He has no right to take the lives of people Father, I just, I, 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 I lift up the families, I lift up their loved ones, I lift up their friends, what, whoever it may be that is, that is affected by, every, by, by affected by this whole thing. Those who may have been injured, those who are just in the trauma of being around 
Father, I ask for your comfort to come upon them. I ask for your peace, your shalom to overtake them. Let your love overflow them and help them in their in their grieving and in their in their distress, Father. May you make yourself known to them. May you, Yahusha, show your light in this dark place. May someone go there. May you send a minister or someone. If they don't believe in you, Yahusha, may you send someone to allow your word, your name, your truth to be proclaimed so they can turn to you and receive that comfort and receive that peace. Father, a lot of us go through issues like this and everything. And again, I lift up all those who are around us who need prayer, who need who need peace, who need um, just to feel your love. So through all the struggles and everything that they're going through, there's a lot of turmoil that's going around. Father, I just ask that you be with us all. I ask that you give us a, a Shavuot of a good week ahead of us. May we see you in all the things that we face, all the trials, all the temptations, all the things, not the temptations because you do not tempt us. May we see the enemy in those temptations and see you through those temptations to, ke to keep us away from giving birth to sin and death. As, John, uh, as James uh, Jacob says, help us to keep our eyes focused on you and keep our eyes just always looking to be able to help those who are around us. May we proclaim your name. May we proclaim your word. May we proclaim your truth wherever we are and just be that beacon of hope for all those around us um, so that they will be able to know that this life is not the life that they should live that the life of obedience to you is the life that was designed for us to live so father we praise you we glorify you we look forward to everything you have in store for us to the these next these coming days these coming weeks as we as we enter into uh the studies and just searching you out and learning more about you and until next shabbat so we thank you we love you we praise you we glorify you in whose name we pray hallelujah hallelujah Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here, um, tuning in. Any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to contact us. Um, and until next Shabbat, Shalom Mishpacha.